Barris, welcome to the podcast. Hello, mate. Long time no see. I know, mate. It's been, I reckon, about 12 years. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, at least 10. My last show was 2014. So. Okay. I think my last fight on your show was 2012. Right. Wow. Still got the uh, the trophy in my, uh, up on the, up on the, on the mantelpiece, mate. <laughs> my moment of glory from back in the day. <laughs> but yeah, it's obviously been a while, mate. And since then... You've obviously uh, done a ton with the band, so the Chris Barris band. Um, you were telling me on the way in that you're fifth in the charts at the moment? Oh, no, we were when the album was released. Okay. Yeah, my latest album, Halo Effect, uh, was released April this year. Yeah. Got to number five in the official album charts, number one in rock and metal. Yeah, it's amazing, mate. What that's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, it's the highest we've, we've ever had. So. Yeah, that's brilliant. But obviously, when I knew you, you were, I think, always involved with music. You'd assume to be as good as you are now that you'd always be involved with music, but you were primarily known locally for Thai boxing, MMA, jiu-jitsu, and obviously being the promoter of Southwest Fighting Championships, um, involved with Fight Works as well. Um, so I want to start back there because I know a lot of the people watching are sort of fight fans, or jiu-jitsu practitioners, and martial artists. So we'll come on to the music stuff for sure. But yeah, tell us maybe about that sort of time and how you got into martial arts and that journey. Yeah, well, I mean, like music, I I started I started playing guitar when I was five and I started doing karate around the same age and, you know, I loved Bruce Lee films and Jean-Claude Van Damme, you know, that kind of thing and the Rocky films. And, uh, yeah, so I kind of just grew up doing martial arts. I moved on to kickboxing in my teens and um, had a couple of years off and then I went back to Thai boxing, well, I started Thai boxing when I was about 18. Um, but I think because of my previous... Like martial arts experience, even though it's a bit more traditional, not really like a fighting sport. Um, I took to it pretty quickly and I think I had my first fight after about nine months or something. Um, yeah, and then went on from there, really. Uh, MMA started booming, um, you know, on Bravo, like Ultimate Fighter. I used to watch it with my dad and I was like, you know, what? I might give this a go. I'd won like my first few Thai boxing fights and uh, started training MMA. And then, uh, yeah, kind of went from there, really. Yeah. And I think you were definitely like an early adopter because even when I got into it, you were already sort of, you know, fairly experienced in, in competing. Um, what do you remember of those early MMA days? The way, what year was this? Are we talking roughly? Uh, I think my first fight was probably like 2006, maybe. Was it? Yeah, that's early, man. Yeah. I think I was just starting jiu-jitsu at that point. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was very different. Yeah. But the rules were different too. Like, obviously pro was pro, but... Um, we didn't like now we've adopted kind of like the American system, um, which I'm really happy about. And I actually used to do that on my show. And I was one of probably the first people in the country to do it because also I spent a lot of time in the States training and saw it. And, um, I thought it was the best way to do it. But obviously when I started off, amateur used to be no headshots at all. So it was all like body shots. What? Uh, yeah, that's what am amateur was like. No headshots standing, no headshots on the ground. Uh, so you just get like grapplers, they'd run at each other. <laughs> you get a body lock, was, uh, it was just terrible. Um, I never actually did that rule set. I went straight to semi-pro, which is what they called it. So that was headshots standing, but no headshots on the floor. But used to wear four ounce gloves. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so the Americans have like the unified amateur rules, which was obviously with a bigger gloves, but you could ground a pounders as well, which, I mean, that's MMA, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's a huge part of MMA grappling to be able to strike on the floor. So it didn't really make sense. Um, so yeah, I think I was one of the first promotions in the company, to, uh, in, the, in the country to actually do that. And I remember contacting some gyms, and some like, bigger name people, like, I won't say their names now, but they, they kind of like laughed at me. Like, oh no, we don't do that. We do semi amateur, semi-pro rules and pro. And I'm like, all right, now we look at it and then like I see they do shows and they do these rules now. I'm like, okay, I've like, still got the messages yeah. where you, <laughs> you laughed at me. Um, but yeah, I mean, it makes sense like, to do it that way. Um, yeah. And how did your first couple of MMA bouts go? Uh, you know so I won all my early tie fights like pretty convincingly uh, in the first or second round uh, by knockout stoppage. And then I started the MMA. But do you know what? I just wasn't... I'd done like some like jujitsu training, a few takedowns, and then tie boxing, and that's like, MMA like you know especially these days. But I mean back then too, like it's about putting it together, right? Mm -hmm. It was like 
you know, you'll get, I've trained with people that, you know, they're not great at striking, they're not great at wrestling, not great at jiu-jitsu, but somehow they just managed to put it together really well and it makes them hard work. Um, and that's what I wasn't good at. And I lost my first MMA fight, Sem Pro one. I came out strong and I remember like, and I did some big kicks. I was like, oh, I'm fine here. And then he grabbed me and I remember being like, all right, okay, yeah, we're wrestling. Then he launched me. I was like, oh, fuck. Oh, oh, yeah, you're jiu-jitsu. And, like and, you know, it's just... And it just... I completely gassed out. And in the second round, like, I remember just, like, being so tired from the grappling that, like, it was easier to just, like, get punched in the face and, like, hold my hands up. <laughs> <laughs> like, I remember just standing there. So I just hit me in the face, like, don't bother me. Like, it, it was too much effort to hold my hands up. And I remember I just... Ended up shooting for like the worst takedown. I just put my head down and I like, ran at him like that. So I got guillotined. But um, I actually, there was a guy called Alex Ward, Welsh lad. He was like, just hard, hard guy, you know. And um, I rematched him. It was both our pro debuts on Knuckle Up. Do you remember that show? Like Dane Bowers used to present it on yeah, Sky. Yeah. It was a really good show. Um, but that was like a couple of years later for our like pro debut. And I'd done a lot of training that time. Like, you know, I'd gone like full time. I was training out at Extreme Couture Gym in Vegas, spent a lot of time out there. Um, and, you know, I think it was just levels different. You know, I've stopped him in one minute 20 or something. Nice. What was that with uh, sort of strikes? So rear naked choke. Yeah. So strike and exchange, caught a kick, hit him, dropped him. Ground and pound. I think he rolled over. Just trying to think if I finished him with... No, it was rear naked choke. He, he was face down. I was whacking him and I think I just choked him. Yeah, yeah, nice. And what was your record in the end? Uh, MMA was 5-2-1. Yeah. Tie boxing 9 no. Yeah. So it's, it's like a decent record, mate. Mm. We'll come on to obviously you moving away from it in a second. But, I mean, you, you were obviously quite entrepreneurial back in the day as well because you were obviously involved with Fightworks and then you had to show, as you've alluded to a couple of times, and then obviously the, the, the brand as well. Did you ever kind of think about just going all in on being an athlete or were you always kind of leaning towards like the other ventures a little bit? Yeah, do you know, it's, it's just tricky. It was, it was hard back then because, especially where we are in the Southwest, like, I think if I went all in I would have, and wanted to try and make it, let's say, all, you know, I don't think I would have ever been good enough, but... Um, I also think it was harder to make the UFC back then. There's not as many yeah. inroads, you know, like now Cage Warriors is like a real clear, like feeder. Do well in Cage Warriors, you'll get signed, you know. And there's a lot of other big promotions too, right? Um, and I did get to fight on a big one out in Singapore, Rebel FC. Um, but, uh, you know, I feel like I would have had to have moved to the States to have had a chance. And like being down here, I never really had like a coach. I'd go in, I'd do training camps, but because I launched like straight into kind of being a coach like pretty early on because there was nothing around. Um, I was in that position of, you know, being responsible for fighters and, and kind of got really stuck into the business side and it hindered, like you said, like the athlete side. And I don't really have any regrets because at the time definitely felt like the right thing to do. Um, but I do look back sometimes and wish, oh, you know, maybe I'd give it a bit more of a go. Um, I d my only regret I have in, in anything in my life was that I, f f honestly, I spent my whole 20s feeling like I had to have everything lined up by the time I was 30. I also felt like life ended at 30, you know? And I think back, I had my last fight when I was 28. Like, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Like, you look at UFC champions now, like, some of them are only, like, a couple of years younger than me. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I could have carried on going for another 10 years, really. Um, I, I did get injured and it was an annoying foot injury, uh, like tendon finger my ankle and it just wouldn't go and I kept like catching it in training and then I'd be like, oh, it would set me back another couple of months. Um, so I did want to carry on, but it was just so hard when you're training other fighters and then, yeah, it's just hard when you're coaching and running a gym to like fight as well. Yeah. Um, and I did have a period, again, like when I was doing the whole Vegas thing, um, I used to go up to Trojan Free Fighters Back then, um, and I don't know what to do now, but back then they had a really good like fight, pro fight team. Yeah. And we used to, the, the owner back then was a guy called Charlie Joseph, it's Ronnie Mann's dad. And he used to have a house, and we'd all stay in there, like bunk beds, all the fighters would count there. And you had like people like Zel Galeshik, Ronnie Mann, just like, absolutely phenomenal, and loads of great fighters. Um, and I did that for a few months, but it's quite hard. Like, like be up there Monday to Friday training full time then come back and try and like teach some PTs and some guitar lessons and do a gig or something to get enough money to be able to train like full time and it's just yeah I don't know I think when it came down to it 
I chose like money, making money over maybe, you know, having a bit more fun. Mm. And I kind of look back and think maybe I should have held off from, you know, trying to make the money. Yeah. I just had this thing like, you know, oh, you've got to be, you know, rich by the time you're 30, you've got to have a house, you've got to be married and all this kind of things, like, because 30's old. And then that's kind of like, I, don't, I look back now and it's ridiculous, but um, yeah, I just had this, this thing. Um, so yeah, I kind of wish maybe I delayed trying to make money because I, got no, I had nothing to show for it. I just spent it all on holidays and cars and <laughs> clothes and shit, you know, I just, I've got nothing to do. I've bought a house, but um, yeah. Yeah, I do, I do wish maybe I'd give it, you know, another go, but mm. like a couple more goes. But. Yeah, well, you've ended up in a, an all right spot, mate, so it's not all too bad. <laughs> and you obviously said you got into coaching a little bit and you're, you're obviously wearing a Fightworks t-shirt and Fightworks have been going for, well, as long as I can remember. Obviously, Darren's involved from a jiu-jitsu perspective. So tell us about kind of how you kind of got into coaching and how Fightworks becoming your involvement with that club. Yeah, so um, when I first got into MMA... I said I was doing the Thai boxing. I was fighting on some shows uh, locally, put on by Howard Hughes, like real great shows at the Riviera Centre in Torquay. And used to get a lot of like, press in the paper and stuff like that. And my fights, you know, I've been in the paper a few times and like, I bumped into someone I used to do karate with. And he was like, oh, I've seen you in the paper. So, you know, you're doing really well. I'm like, oh, cool, thanks. And then um, I was like, well, actually, I'm trying MMA now. That's what I've started to do. And he's like, oh, I do uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I was like, no way. I couldn't believe that there was a Brazilian jiu-jitsu club, like, around. Um, and he's like, yeah, yeah, we have an open mat on a Sunday. Just come along. Everyone's really cool. Um, and I was like, do you know what? I'm going to do that. So I went along, and um, it's literally in the back room of a weights gym. I mean, I'm like, four metres by four metres, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> like, if, if we're lucky. Like, like, like most gyms back then. <laughs> it, was, it was tiny. Um, and Darren... Darren Yeoman and Paul Carfee were running it. And then, back then it was called Torbay BJJ. Um, and they'd only just got their purple belts. But back then that was huge, mm. you know, like a purple belt back in 2006. Like it was, it was a big deal, you know. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I remember I'd, I went with Paul first and he let me start from side control top. And so like, you know, obviously I'd like just... A yep, like 21 years old or whatever, like a fighter. So I'm like, ah, go mad. And he was like, armbarred me. And I was like, what? And I just couldn't <laughs> believe like what had happened. And, um, you know, then he was like breaking down. Oh yeah, but you don't want to do this. Don't put your arm there, do this. And, I, and I'm thinking like, these guys are ace. And um, turns out I actually knew Darren anyway, because I used to teach his mum guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Random. <laughs> randomly. <laughs> randomly. And uh, I used to play in like a cover band locally and he'd actually come... Uh, to watch us play with his mum once, and I'd met him then, and I, and I you know, I didn't realise that's like what he did. And um, yeah, me and Darren hit off like straight away, and um, so I started still doing my Thai boxing and like MMA bits um, where I was training, but doing more like the jujitsu with Darren because I was like, I'm learning a lot here. You know, he's a great instructor, super knowledgeable, and like really cares. You know. Um, then he was like, yeah, I want to get full-time premises and do this kind of thing. And was like, would you be up for, like, teaching some MMA classes and stuff? Because by this time, like, I'd started going to Vegas and doing that kind of stuff. And then going to Trojan as well. Um, and I was like, yeah, cool. Like, I'm on board. So I started teaching there once he opened up that first one. Then I invested when we got the bigger gym. Um, so we, like, outgrew that in a couple of years. Then I got involved financially and... Um, Someone else did another friend of ours, Matt Gudgeon, and uh, yeah, to make the gym bigger. And we created probably one of the first like proper MA gyms, like mm. in the Southwest, really. You know, we had a 20 foot cage and stuff like that. Yeah, and back, that was 2009, 2010. Yeah. So early to have that as well. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, it was it was a good, great gym, mate. And like I said, uh, I said offline a second ago, but back when me and Doyle were fighting on your show, you know, we had some good good sort of uh i guess partners down here but not many fighters and there was no cage so we used to travel up and train with you guys quite a bit and it yeah. was even back then like yeah as you say 2010 2011 not just all the gear but a beautiful looking gym as well like yeah all white mm. like it was stunning you know what i mean so so yeah it was a good gig mate and i remember you kind of primarily being known for like obviously mma but more of a Thai boxer than a jiu-jitsu guy like where do you consider yourself like now and, and thinking back are you a mixed martial artist? Do you consider yourself a Muay Thai fighter or a Jiu Jitsu practitioner? 
I mean, all of it really. Yeah. You know, it's hard. So I don't really, don't really think about it. I don't yeah, <laughs> really yeah. Define myself in, in any, in any way really. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's probably strongest at the tie boxing. That was probably my strongest thing. Um, it's probably where I had the most success. Mm. You know, I ended up number six, six or seven in the UK rankings uh, at middleweight, 72.5. Um, yeah, that's probably probably my strongest, mm. I'd say. Yeah. Um, I always tried to be well-rounded, you know. I, was, I put a lot of effort to the wrestling, especially after, like, training out in America and feeling that. You know, those fighters, you know, UFC fighters that I'd stand with and I'd be like, this, like, I'm absolutely fine here. And then that would be in like the, what they, they call it, kickboxing. And I'm like, okay, takedowns now. And then it'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd land a couple of leg kicks and then they'd time it and now I'm on my back and I'm having a horrible time. Yeah. And that's when I realized how important wrestling was. Yeah, 100%. So you, you've alluded to obviously training in America a couple of times. And I remember you traveling a fair bit, I think, obviously to the States. And did you go to Thailand as well at some point? Yeah, yeah. I fought in Thailand, yeah. Yeah. So you obviously traveled about a bit. And as we just said, training in the UK was relatively limited. So tell us about your travels and, and sort of training out in the States and, and where you trained and yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, so I first went out early 2008, so I was like 22, uh, to Extreme Couture Gym. Mm. And that was like in the heyday, like... That was the place to go, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, you know, looking around the room, it was like, like a who's who. It was incredible. It was who, who was there? Uh, oh, everyone. Um, so, so Rand, Randy Couture, it was his gym. Yeah, right? Randy Couture's yeah. gym. Yeah, and he was wicked. He was always like he'd check in, like every every week. He'd be like, "Oh, how are you getting on?" You know, and like it was like really really nice. And um, he'd always remember me. You know, because I'm like a nobody going out there. You know, just a young hungry lad that wanted to go out and train and to experience it. Um, I had to prove myself to be allowed to do the pro training. I went to like a, a public class like first, and then the guy was like, "Yeah, I think you'll be okay." And then you kind of have to go through a bit of a, a ritual on the first session. So it's like Mike Pyle, do you remember him? He kind of used to run the pro training, and um, you kind of got to go through a round with him. <laughs> and uh, say so I uh, spent a fair bit of time on the floor, mm -hmm. and we weren't doing takedowns. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I saw saw ribs <laughs> for a few days after that. But yeah, I mean, uh, Vondelay Silva was there. Uh, Vito Belfort, Caro Parisian. Uh, my weight, my weight class. It was like Gray Maynard, Tyson Griffin, uh, Mac Danzig. You remember him? He won the Ultimate Fight. He was actually probably one of the most impressive people that uh, I trained with and saw in the gym. Like his technique really? and stuff was phenomenal. Mm. Like really good. Uh, Sam Stout, uh, Johnny Hendricks. So I used to actually part. Johnny Hendricks was probably in like two and O, three and O back then. Like he wasn't part of the UFC. He was. Um, He'd come from like wrestling, obviously. He was like a big name in like collegiate wrestling, mm. four times NCAA champ or something like that. And he got into MMA, and I used to partner up with him quite quite a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, he was cool. Um, yeah, loads of people, loads. Of, and you just get a lot of visitors too. People would like pop in, yeah, um, and, and be there for a while, and yeah. Standard sounds unbelievable. Yeah, yeah especially was, back oh, then. I mean, like you know, I was I was at the bottom of the bottom of the pile <laughs> that's for sure did you feel you improved massively though in that time oh yeah i mean just feeling it do you know what i mean like feeling people like gray maynard and tyson griffith like that level you know these are ufc lightweights you know at the time i'm like oh yeah i want to be like them and then you're like i've got a long fucking way to go like really really good and same like hendrix you know johnny hendrix back then you know striking wasn't what it ended up being in, in by the time he was in the ufc um but as soon as like takedowns were brought in, like that guy, you know, it's just another league. And there was loads of people like that. And, um, you know, it was, it was quite like, but so many of them were just great. You know, like Vondelay Silva. So I'd already been out there about a month or so. And then Vondelay Silva came over. He ended up setting his own gym up in Vegas. I don't know if it's still going or not, one fight center. But um, he just, this was like the first time he was coming over to train in Vegas. And, um, so he did. He didn't know who I was. Didn't know that you know he'd arrived at the gym. Just thought I was like one of the boys. So he treated me like. Yeah. And I'm like, no, I'm just like some little, <laughs> some little scruff trying to blag his way through. <laughs> but like every day he'd come in and he'd shake my hand and be like, hello, buddy, hello, but like the nicest guy. Really? And then once I like clinch sparred with him, like wrestling, and um, 
you know, he could obviously just feel that, you know, I wasn't, I mean, I was a lot smaller than him anyway, but like, you know, he, he was throwing me around stuff, but was like really like letting me work and was like very gentle and, you know, I reckon if we, I never sparred with him stand up. I reckon if I did, I probably would have got hurt because I probably would have like accidentally landed like a leg kick too yeah. hard or something. <laughs> and it probably, because I saw him have some tear ups with, I'm not going to name names, but I saw him have some tear ups with some, some uh, big names in the UFC and the gym. Um, and let's just say I'm pleased I wasn't involved in any of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think back then, the sort of, especially like Wanderlei and those Brazilians over at Shooterbox, the sparring was notorious though, wasn't it? Yeah. It was notorious for just being an absolute war zone. Yeah. 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 I mean, his nickname, if you don't know, is, is the Axe Murderer. So <laughs> it, it gives you a rough but idea about I'll his, tell you, he's his like style. the nicest guy. Like, would come in and he'd shake everyone's hands. All the serial like, killers always are though, mate, isn't there? That's it. <laughs> mask, mate. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, yeah, I said he was, he was really, uh, really, really nice. Um, yeah. There was, not everyone was nice. But I'd say 99.9%. I was going to say, the Eagles in that room must have been crazy. Yeah, like, I think the only stuff I saw was just when it was between people in the same weight class, and it's like, one day we might end up fighting each other, you know, and I think that's the only problem with, I don't know if any gyms like that really exist anymore because mm. of that kind of reason. Like, so many people used to come and train there and be there for a few months or think about joining, but then you end up with quite a few, like, people in the same weight class are, like, probably going to be fight, you know, and then it got yeah. like, well, are you a teammate or your rival? And then it's like especially when you get people like big names, they're already big names, then they're moving to that gym. And then there's a big name that's already at that gym. It was like, do you know what I mean? Definitely caused some problems, wasn't it? I know if, if yeah. you were in that position, you'd be like, who the fuck is this? Yeah. But um, it was great. So overall, like people were awesome and um, the social side of things of it as well. Um, meeting up af after training and stuff and like, yeah, it was wicked. Yeah, was it in Vegas, yeah? Vegas, yeah. yeah. I went out like there a few times and then there was a bit of a split. Um, 2010, I think it was. And Sean Tompkins, who's the, the head coach, um, he'd gone to the tap out center and like half the fighters had gone to tap out center, half to extreme chore. So then I went to tap out center like the last time I went. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and without naming names, was there any sort of like big fallouts that you saw where what we just talked about, obviously, where there's a bit of rivalry? Did that ever really yeah. kick off? <laughs> I'm definitely not going to. I think like, you know, pro training was like behind closed doors. Mm. And I think, um, you know, it would be wrong of me to to say, you know, name names. But yeah, there was definitely some... Was there anything with you involved? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd won. What, this is the thing, like, everyone was so cool, but there was one guy who's an absolute dickhead. Absolute dickhead. And that is the New York badass Phil Baroni. Is absolute bellend. <laughs> <laughs> like, he did, like, he was terrible as well. Like, rubbish, wouldn't train hard. We just strut around the gym. Um, and, uh, yeah, he like, so we, me and we had a couple of run-ins just cause I think he was just a bully. Like, so the gym had like a matted area that was like caged off, but that, at the end it kind of curved a little bit and I was sparring with someone there and he walked over, didn't even have a training partner. Like no one had partnered up with him. And like, this isn't like a, a you know, an organized session. It's not open mat or anything like that. It's like a class, but he just hadn't grabbed a partner walked straight over to us, pushed like, both of us. We're like sparring, like, all right, mate. He's like, this is my corner. I'm like, all right. He's like, get out of my corner. I'm like, okay, fine. So no, we like moved. Um, the guy I was with, again, was like, he was a lower level fighter, like an American guy. He didn't speak up. Um, and I was like, that's a bit weird. And he was just like, Meh. we just carried on. And he just stood there on his own. It wasn't even like... <laughs> Training. It wasn't like, oh, I want to use this corner because I'm practicing like my wall work or to, like, do you know what I mean? It wasn't even training, it's just, just being a bully. And like the next week, um, we were, it was a bit more, it was a grappling class and it was like situational sparring and it was uh, like guard passing, right? So everyone had to start inside someone's guard. So we switched, I'd been, you know, we've been going around, everyone's switching around and, you know, Phil has to go and me. And then he comes up and he goes, I'm not starting from there. I'm like, all right. And he just goes straight to side control. <laughs> He's on me in side control. I'm like, right, I'm like a 22 year old kid. Like I've been watching this guy on TV. I'm like, all right, okay. Like, yeah, cool. So then he like just starts from side control. He's just going like ape shit on me. And I'm like, like, it's always a weird situation I always found with like sparring. Like, 
you don't want to go too hard because you don't want them to think like you're being a dick. And it's like really hard to like gauge. But because he was going so hard on me, he's like starting like ground and pounding me and stuff. I'm like, I'm a 22 year old lightweight, like with a few fights under my belt. Like, come on, like. And he was just going ape shit on me. And I think like, r like elbowing, like just going like, just being an absolute prick. Um, so I went like mad to get him off. I end up regaining my guard. And then he just spazzed trying to get past. And as he was spazzing, um, he was spazzing, not me. My foot hit him like here and um, he like screamed. <laughs> he fucking screamed. Like held his eye. I was like, ah. ah. I was like, oh my God. And he ran up to Sean Tompkins, the coach. I was like, oh my eye, my eye, my eye. I was thinking like, it barely even like touched him. Uh, and Sean was like, yeah, you're fine, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> and then he just went off and like sat down. I was just like, oh. Yeah, he was an absolute bell end. But like, another funny story. So no one was allowed in to watch pro training, right? It was gyms closed, it was like four till six, I mean, and it was like closed. Because in the daytime, you'd always get like, you know, it became a bit of a tourist attraction. I even had like people asking photos of me and like, oh, you know, they didn't even know who I was, but I'd like, be in there like training the day. They're just getting photos of everyone. Um, but the gym was like strictly like closed doors for pro training. And um, there was always this old guy like sat on the bleachers watching. And I never really talked to him. He'd sometimes say hello to me and stuff like that. But like, we'd just be quiet and just sit on the bleachers. And we were out, me and a few of the fighters having some beers one night. I said, who's that old guy that watches train all the time? And they all started laughing. They're like, that's Phil Brony's dad. I was like, what do you mean? Because that's Phil Brony's dad. They're like, he watches training because he doesn't believe that Phil will come. <laughs> like, if it, he doesn't believe when Phil says he's gone training. So he'll come and sit there and watch him. Wow. <laughs> but yeah, he's an absolute prick, like absolute prick. Yeah, it's a shame. He's the only one. Everyone was like wicked. Yeah, everyone was wicked. It's weird, isn't it? Though in, in most places, you always have one, don't you? Always have one bell in that room. Yeah, there, there's just no need. Like I said, like you know, it's just disrespectful on like all fronts. You know, if the the instructor was telling us to do guard passing, and then he's like, "No, I'm just gonna start from side control." Like it's just disrespectful. Yeah, right? it is disrespectful. But regardless of me, that. like I'm a nobody. Like you haven't got to respect me. But that's like disrespecting the coach, right? Yeah. Yeah, I hate stuff like that. Yeah, well, obviously, if any if anybody wants to, to know what Phil's up to these days, they can go and Google it and find out. <laughs> yeah, because it's uh, yeah, it's not going well for him. <laughs> well, worse for his I, don't, I don't know who he is, mate. And he's uh, he's currently in a Mexican prison. Oh, is he for murdering his wife? Allegedly murdering his girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. is he? Has he no not been convicted way. yet? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. In Mexico. Yeah. Mm. Won't want to be him. <laughs> no. He'll probably, he'll probably uh, appreciate his corner in Mexico, won't he? So, <laughs> good for him. That is mental. Uh, <laughs> Got off lightly, mate. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm slagging him off. Right? Yeah, yeah, he's, he's in Mexico. Come and beat me up. Do you know, I'd love to fight, and I, wouldn't, I don't even think I'd beat him, but I would, I would maybe now. But um, I would, it's someone I just, I just love to fight. I just want to be able to punch him. I don't even care if I got knocked out or lost. I just want to be able to punch him as hard as I can in his face. He's a fucking pro. Yeah, yeah. He was out training at Tiger Muay Thai in Thailand when I was there. I'd never interacted with him, but he's just—you always knew when he was in the room because he was just an absolute loudmouth. Yeah, you know, I'm always making some sort it's of. Like, I speak to other people and they'd be like, "Oh, no, it feels alright." And like I said, he hasn't got to respect me. I was like a little no mark, you know. But I was respectful, nice, and you know, Fondley Silver can be cool with me. Well, like, why can't you? Do you know what I mean? Like, no, he's just a bully. Yeah, just a bully. And how, how was it sort of uh, staying in Vegas for like a period of time? Did you manage to keep out of trouble? Yeah, so I mean, I used to like rent an apartment that was like, it was on Las Vegas Boulevard, but like five miles south from the strip. Right, that's a long way. Because yeah. the road, I mean, Las Vegas Boulevard yeah. was huge. So it's about five miles away from like Mandalay Bay, mm -hmm. south. So you were away from it. And how was you affording that? Well, do you know what? It wasn't that expensive back then. It was like 2.1 to the pound, like dollars. Oh, yeah. It wasn't that bad. It wasn't that expensive, really. And I used to rent, like, a, an apartment, so... Yeah, like, it wasn't that bad to no, actually do it. You no, know, like, it was just, like, a little little apartment, like, you know? Yeah. He's Martin Campman, do you remember? He used to, yeah. like, live, like, near me. And okay. Yeah, I used to get lifts and stuff, and... Yeah. He was on, like, the same complex. Yeah, and you've got the uh, the Vegas tattoo, I think, somewhere, right? Somewhere, yeah. There it is. Guns. Yeah, yeah, nice. <laughs> little gun chill for the uh, podcast. <laughs> So yeah, that was cool, man. And and then sort of, you know, just to, to wrap up on the MMA stuff, I guess, or the fighting, what was your like biggest achievement in MMA, would you say, from a competitor's perspective? Do you know, I don't really think I did much. Um, it was cool to get the opportunity to fight on Rebel FC in Singapore. Yeah. It was a big show, it was yeah. like 8,000 people. And, you know, people like, you know, Miguel Torres on the car and stuff like that. Like, it was pretty cool um, to fight on a show of like that, that caliber. 
Um, I lost, but it was a, it was a great experience. I wasn't really training MMA at the time. I was in Thailand doing Thai boxing, and um, Tim Fisher at the gym I was at sits on Pinong. Um, was like, you do MMA, right? I was like, yeah. And he goes, I could get you a fight if you want. And I was like, cool. And it, and it just came it. about like that. And <laughs> he was like, no, it's a big show. It'd be good. And I was like, oh, cool. And then it, and it was. Um, so I hadn't really done much MMA training. Um, in, I'd just been focusing on, on the Muay Thai. Um, but it was cool. You know, it was, one of those, it was a funny thing. Like, in the rules meeting, Miguel Torres was complaining about the canvas, I mean, it wasn't canvas, it was like vinyl. He was like saying about how it's slippy and obviously like he's used to fighting in like UFC and WEC and stuff like that, which would have proper canvas. And he was complaining about the rules and he's like, oh man, this is really slippy. And I remember thinking like, ah, oh, what's he whinging about? Like, this is what we fight on like back home, like in the small shows. Anyway, I came out like first like 20 seconds and I landed a couple of kicks and you know, I fought against this Korean guy and he kept dropping his hand, like, as I was kicking his leg, I was like, I'm going to knock this guy out. I was going to kick him in his head. And I threw this head kick and just went, whoop, slipped. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, shit. Well, he won his previous fight um, against this, like, like, the number one, like, Singaporean fighter. Uh, he, the guy was on the floor, and then as he stood up, he threw a flying knee and KO'd him. And I could see him like that, and I was like, oh, I don't... And then that was just in the back of my head. And then so I ended up standing on my back. And I felt comfortable, you know, the commentators were like, oh, you know, like, Chris, get a submission here, like, try, and I'm getting, like, getting fairly close. I'm like, oh, yeah, I feel all right here. But then I just didn't. He was strong, he had good base, and then landed, like, uh, had quite a few elbows. And it's like, it wasn't hurting, because I had so much adrenaline. He just kept hitting me in the temple, and I just remember, like, going, like, a bit fuzzy-headed, but, like, it wasn't hurting. So I was kind of like, you know, every time I got hit, I was like, oh, it's not really bothering me. But then it was like, it felt like a, you know, like a street fighter, like a power bar, like just going yeah, okay. down. <laughs> and I was like, oh man. And then I was recovering the second round. And then third round I won, but it was like too little too late. Mm. But it was just an amazing experience fighting yeah, on, yeah. on a show of that level, that caliber um, was pretty cool. And then I went to Thailand, I went back to Thailand from there. And then I f had a fight three weeks after that. Um, and I was supposed to be fighting a, that was Muay Thai, obviously, and I was supposed to be fighting against a Thai guy. Um, now, when you fight against a Thai in the smaller like local stadiums, it can kind of be like one or two. Do you know what I mean? You can end up fighting like a tuk-tuk driver, <laughs> like, <it's> just, been, <laughs> just doing it for a bit of cash. Um, or it's like sometimes you can get like one of the trainers who's a little bit like sneaky. Like one time I got offered to fight um, against like Lerzila, who was like had like three hundred odd fights, a like, top top fighter, and my coach was like. He's like, you only do it if it's basically weren't paying enough money. He's like, you'd need more money to fight that guy. Mm. I mean, he would have like murdered me mm -hmm. in one round. But um, <laughs> but yeah, I wanted to fight against Tiger. Like, you know, a lot of my fights back home had turned into like scrap fests and stuff. Like a lot of the time, you know, particularly back back then, like um, on the smaller Thai shows, like it would turn a bit hand heavy and quite scrappy. And I wanted to have like a nice proper Thai fight. And and so, yeah, I was quite excited about fighting a Thai. Anyway, it was like the night before I get like a Facebook messenger message off my Thai trainer and he was like, you not fight Thai. <laughs> I'm like, it's like half nine, I'm about to like go sleep. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, uh, you fight for belt, you win, you champion. I was like, I, I don't understand. It's like, what, what's going on? I was like, who am I fighting? He's like, don't know. He's like, you win, you champion. I'm like, all oh, right, I don't know what the <laughs> hell is like going on. <laughs> and so like, and look, it's only like Bangladesh, like, you know, it's not a, like a real, it's not like it's a lumpini title or anything like that, but like, um, I didn't know who I was fighting, so I turned up. All I knew it wasn't a Thai guy, but it, it banged like you all get ready and warmed up in the, like, the same area, and we were on last. And so I was like, kind of like looking as the, because all the fight cards were in Thai as well. And I asked my Thai <laughs> trainer, I was like, who am I fighting? And he just looked around, and it was like someone who was like fairly big, because you know, fighting at like 75 kilos, so I mean, you're one of the bigger. People looks around. He's like, uh, maybe him. <laughs> just point some <laughs> random guy. I'm like, all right, okay, fine. So then, as the fights are going on, like slowly, slowly working out, I'm like there's about four fights left, and there's a guy in the corner. I was like, right, it's obviously him. It was like a, a big Russian guy, and and he was decent. He was really good. Uh, so it was good from that that point of view. Like I got to have a good fight, um, but I'd never been dropped in any of my fights, and he dropped me with an elbow in round two. And it was really like the first round. I remember going back to the corner and be like, oh, this is really nice. Like, I remember a nice fight. It was just fun. Like, it was a bit more chill. It was in Thailand, you know, the rounds one and two. And the judges don't even pick up 
their their pencil, like you know what I mean. They, they barely they don't really score it. So um, you know, one and one was nice. It was like playing. It was like a nice technical fight. I was like, oh, this is fun. I came back and I said to my call team, I was like, this is fun. I'm like, I'm really enjoying it. And they're like, good, good. Like you're gonna win this. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I feel I feel like I'm beat this guy easy. And it came out. And then um, again, it was like nice and chill. Boom, I was beating him with the body kicks and stuff. And then he just steps in to clinch. And I was like, cool. And I just like did like a, it's a bit of like a, a lazy frame. And he just did like an up elbow as he like came in, hit me there. And I mean, you like see on the, like the, the video, like I literally fall like a tree. <laughs> Boom, my head bounces off the canvas. I think that woke me back up. It was weird, it wasn't even that hard, it just hit me right there. So I'd never been dropped and it just turned out the lights. And um, yeah, my head banged off. I mean, if it was in England, it would have been like a KO. And then the Russian was like celebrating. So the ref turned around and was like, get back in your corner, get back in your corner. And that bought me more time. So I ended up standing up and I thought I just slipped over. Like, I just didn't know what was like going on. And I'm just, you see on the video, like it turns, I stand up, I fall into the ropes. And just as I like bounce back up like that, the ref turns and was like, you ready, fight. And so, like, <laughs> you see, I just staggered towards him. Anyway, I managed to just grab him and like, I elbowed him and I cut him it's like straight away. Um, I, I had to have stitches uh, there, and he had to have about ten, I think, in the end. Um, and we got into like a like a real scrap in the middle, and I was elbowing, we were whacking each other. Um, but then I ended up beating him in, in the fourth. Got stuck, stopped because because that cut, it was just bad. His whole face was covered in blood, and um, I kept. I, mean, I was doing horrible things. I was like rubbing it in the corner, and like, <laughs> 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 just, just making it worse. I was, like, just, every, yeah, I was being horrible. Um, but yeah, so I mean, that was quite cool. That's probably my. My most memorable fight, mm. I think, like, you know, like my early fights, I won a lot by stoppage. And I remember like, the first couple of times, it's like, it's amazing, right? But then it would get to the point where it's like, oh, I want to like learn a bit. And mm. I remember when I lost my first MA fight, I was actually really happy after it. I was like the first like half an hour, hour after I was a bit gutted. And I was like, do you know what? It was actually cool. Like, I'm going to learn from this. And it like, like giving me like the hunger. So like, right, I never want to feel like that in a fight again. Like my conditioning's got to be better, my wrestling's got to be better, and I've got to be better at putting it all together. And it, like, drove me on. Um, and so, yeah, I like, I, I've always preferred when I've had, like, a bit of adversity, do you know what I mean? So the fact I got dropped and then had to come back from that. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's probably my favourite one. Yeah, and then, what, you retired as champion. <laughs> <laughs> took, took my belt and fucked off. Yeah, it yeah, sounds like a good scrap. Is that is that out there anywhere to see? Um... Only like the last round. Yeah, okay. So the knockout's not around. Shame. Yeah. That's on my hard drive somewhere. If Stashed away. If that was, that would be right here. About now <laughs> <in the> village, <laughs> mate. <laughs> and how did you find Thailand, mate? Because I spent a couple of the, not, not too long, about a month out there, I think. And it was so hard to stay out of trouble just because it was so much partying and it's just that obviously that you can just get, get away with anything out there. Did you manage to kind of, you know, be strict with the training or did you indulge in the, the local temptations or anything I, like where were you at sort of phuket yeah so like in the the fighting days like when you've got a fight lined up yeah. it's a little bit easier just to be able to like focus on that mm. i went when i was younger and i first went when i was like 18 19 with people from the gym and that yeah he wanted to go and have beers and stuff like that because i was a kid and like oh yeah and i didn't have a fight book to just train in in the gym and i didn't really get it i wasn't i don't think i was good enough to like I didn't really get the Thai way of training. I was like, I'm not really learning anything. They're just like beasting me. So it's just fitness. And I, I didn't really enjoy it that much. And it wasn't until, you know, when I actually committed to a gym for like a longer period of time, I was like fighting for that gym that I started getting a lot more out. The trainers obviously, the trainers see so many people coming and going all the time. And so I think when you commit to a gym, it's like, oh, I'm, I, you know, well, I'm fighting for this gym. You get like a lot more care and... and yeah, once once I had like fights booked and cutting weight and stuff, like it's a lot easier to stay like focused. And also the gym is a lot harsher on you. Like mm -hmm. you're no longer just someone that just turns up. It's like you're fighting, so like you have to be there and you've got to do your runs and you know in the morning and that kind of stuff. So you can't be going out getting smashed if mm. you got to do a ten k before a two hour fucking training session in the morning. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Did you have to do the? Was it the big bottle run? Did you ever do that one? No. No. Is the, well, the gym I was at was based in. Uh, at the time, sits on Penang Phuket was based in Kamala Beach. Right. Okay. Um, there was one run that was horrific. It would go down. He would drive us to Patong yeah. in the trucks, and then we'd have to run back. But it's literally like up a mountain, mm. like to get back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, that was pretty ruthless. And to do that before, like you've got to do all your pads. And yeah, in the, in the heat as well, yeah. in the heat. What was that? Um, I think it was down that way. I can't, what was that bar where you used to get the tourists that used to go there and fight? Did you ever go there? Uh, it was literally just a bar that had a ring. There's and that in Koh Samui. There's one, I forgot what it's called. Well, so it used to be a bar with a ring and they used to just get people randomly. Yeah, so they, they'd give you like, they'd come around and say, do you want a free bucket of booze? And you're, yeah, all right. And they go, right, go in and have a fight. Yeah, give you a free bucket. no way. So there's a couple of smaller ones in Phuket that I saw. <laughs> yeah. It but might have the, even been on, on, on Koh Phi It might have been down there. Right. What idea that is, though? Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure. There is one. I can't remember what's... I, used to know, I can't remember the name of it. There'll be people watching that will be like... Yeah, put it, put it in the comments. <laughs> um, reggae Reggae Bar? Is that the one? It sounds familiar. It might be that. Might be that. Yeah. You, they always get videos popping up on TikTok. And yeah, that. yeah. Um, but yeah, that was fucking mad. That's, that's, an, that's an idea, <laughs> yeah. though, isn't it? I, mean, doing I remember seeing it. I saw one, and I can't remember if it was when I was in Bangkok when I was younger, younger, but I can't remember when it was, but I remember watching and it was a Western. He'd also done a bit of training and it was basically like some fat tuk-tuk kind of guy that was fighting in the ring and he stoved in this tie. And then they were like, no, no, you stay here. And then they got someone else. <laughs> <laughs> and then he got like then destroyed. Got... Oh no. Got destroyed. Yeah, it's mate. Horrible, that, just, that, that just gave you like an indication of how like, unregulated Thailand is as a country. Like everything's like that. It's funny, though. But the fact they just allow just random tourists to go in, they're pissed off and just chin each other <laughs> for entertainment. Great. Yeah. Yeah, good times. Where did you get the nickname from, mate? Well, boom, boom. Because in my early fights, it was one, two, and it was all over. Yeah, boom, nice. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, nice. <laughs> That's the official story. That's the official. What's the unofficial? <laughs> <laughs> just works with barrister. Yeah, it's got a good room to it. Alliteration. Mate. Yeah. So obviously then you, you spent time out there, you came back, and then you obviously ran Southwest Fighting Championships. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where I, I met you. Um, tell us about that, because Dana White obviously talks about UFC, obviously com completely different echelon, but managing fighters, trying to organise fighters... But what was your experience of that promotion like? And how did it come about, first of all? Yeah, um, I can't even remember, but I can't remember why I started it. Probably just because we had quite a few fighters and we were always traveling to other shows. Mm. And it was like, there wasn't a massive amount in the Southwest at the time. It was like one or two people doing some things. Um, there certainly wasn't anything in our, our area at that time. Um, so yeah, started Southwest Fighting Championships. And my, my whole aim with it is like, you know, it was a small nightclub show. It was a pretty cool feel, as you remember, because it had the balcony. It almost felt like a bit of like a Coliseum type thing. Yeah, like people yeah, were yeah. screaming over him. We used to get, I mean, my first show was like, my first show was about 800 people in there. And then I think the second one was 950, completely oversold, really. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just, it was an incredible atmosphere. Yeah. Um, but my whole idea was to kind of, it was like a small local show, but to kind of give it a big show feel in the sense of like, you know, I used to do, uh, we're like the media kind of side of things, you know, good photos, good videos. Um, I used to do like fighter, like promo videos and stuff like that back then. And um, yeah, to try and people, make people feel like they're fighting on, on a bigger show than it is really. Um, but yeah, it was cool. I, the, I think I did, I don't know, 12, 13, but it got to the point where, you know, this happens a lot with, with a lot of businesses. There'll be a couple of successful things and then, you know, people see that and they're like, well, I'll do that. Oh, well, I'll do that. And then everyone tries doing it and then it kind of gets saturated. And then, you know, people either stick with it or they, they go bust or whatever. But yeah, it got to the point where it's just like, it was just so hard to get fighters because there's so many shows and you have an amateur fighters going like, oh, well, this show's offered me 400 quid. I'm like, you're an amateur fighter. I'm not paying you fucking 400 quid. Like, you don't even sell any tickets. Like, it's just mad. It's got so hard to get fighters because there were so many shows um, so that, you know, it got to the point where it's just not worth the headache. And you're completely reliant on other people, right? Like, the final, like, three weeks before a show, like, you just don't sleep because you're, like, waiting for a message to come in, oh, I can't fight of you know, broke my foot or I've hurt my pinky or got tummy ache or, do you know what I mean? Like this, yeah. and you're like, oh, for fuck's sake. Yeah. Like, it's just a nightmare. And you just, like I said, you're completely reliant on other people and I just couldn't hack it anymore. I was like, oh, it's just not worth it. Like the first few shows, like, I, you know, I, I was making like, pretty good money, so it was kind of worth the hassle. But by the end of it, because everything was so diluted and, you know, I probably saturated my own market doing two or three shows a year. 
that it got to point I was like, it's just not worth it for the money I'm earning. Like, it's just not worth the sleepless nights. So I just stopped. Yeah, it was a good show though, mate. It was. And we were talking off air, but these days, certainly where we are now, there's barely any kind of local shows. And it's surprising because, again, you were like an early adopter. So we're talking like 10, 12 years ago when you were doing this. And now obviously UFC, certainly post-pandemic, is massive now. Yeah. And you'd think now would be the time when you'd see loads of shows. But like you say, back then, it was it was you guys doing it really well. Exeter were doing okay. A couple popped up and went in Cornwall. And then, you know, a couple locally, which were a bit of a shit show, to be honest. But there was quite a lot going on. But yeah, I think yours was always a bit of a standout, mate. That little cage though, fucking hell, mate. 18 foot, yeah. That's oh. all we could fit in on the dance yeah. floor. <laughs> but it was, I remember the first time I got in there, yeah. you come down the stairs, you come up, you, you, the sort of changing rooms were like on an upper level. And the, the ring was on basically, or the cage was on like the dance floor, I think pretty much, wasn't it? So you'd come down the stairs right. and get into the cage and there would be a, like a veranda right over the top. So you'd have people like oh, screaming. Like looking over you. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. My first fight, I was nervous as fuck anyway. And the lad I was fighting was like a bit more local to that end than I was. I literally came out, came down the stairs and all his mates were like right along <laughs> right there and just giving me fuck coming down the stairs. And I was like, <laughs> I was nervous anyway. And then you get in the cage, mate, it's so small when you're in there. Yeah. But it made for some good fights though. Yeah, we had some absolute bangers. We had some absolute bangers. Um, and and, and Ty and K1 rules as well. Um, yeah, we had some we had some great nights. Yeah, and and I'll tell you a funny story because you probably don't remember this, but I do. But like managing fighters and working with fighters, you said we're a pain in the ass, right? And there was an occasion where me and Mark Doyle were sat outside, sat, sat waiting for our medical, and we're sat there being dickheads, and we're sat there. I look at Mark and I go, "How's your AIDS, mate?" And he's like, "Yeah, it's all right, a bit of a flare up, but blah blah blah." We're chatting away about having AIDS, being dickheads. Get in, see the doctor, sit down, does the medical, and he goes looks at me in the face and goes, anything else you want to tell me? And I was like, no, no. <laughs> and he was like, nothing else at all you want to mention? And I was like, no, I don't think so. Good. And anyway, we left. And then you came over about half an hour later and you went, all right, lads? Like, yeah, how was the AIDS? And we were like, what? Was like, you were like, the fucking doors open your dickhead. So you fucking heard everything you said. So, <laughs> so the fucking doctor was like, bankers. But that sort of shit you must have had all the time. Just yeah, people being, just, being a pain in the ass. Yeah, I mean, that's funny, but um, it was just the pullouts. Like, yeah. You know, you'd get it on the, oh, some on the day. Mm. Oh, it's just fucking crazy. It's such a big thing in it for some people as well. Like nerves, you know, any excuse to get out of competition. Yeah. Any, you know, it's, it must be a nightmare. It must mm. be yeah. a nightmare. I think that's why though, it's hard to get like, sort of like a league or any sort of like consistency with like a lot of these things because there are so many pullouts. Imagine if you've done like a, a jiu-jitsu or a MMA kind of league around the country or something like that. It's a great idea, but actually pulling it off with the pullouts, the injuries, the bits and pieces, I think that's why it never really works. Yeah. Yeah, tough one. And then uh, around that time, you obviously had the clothing brand as well, the MMA or, or sort of fight apparel brand. Yeah. yeah. I really, I really like that, mate. I, I love the designs and I love the, you know, the, the color and the brand of it. Whatever happened with that? And do you know, I just really struggled to to get it off the ground. Like, stuff looked cool. It was really hard to get the quality control in, like, the early what days. What was it called? Forza Luta. I like a name. Um, it's just made up, like, it's not, it's like Brazilian Portuguese, but it's two words thrown together that aren't normally put together. So Luta obviously means fight, Forza means force. So it's kind of like, oh, it means fight and force, but it doesn't really. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just made it up. But yeah, it looked cool. And like, I think the branding stuff was great. And, you know, we, we, we were fortunate to have, you know, some top, top fighters like wearing the gear, like mm. Paul Daly, Brad Pickett, um, Shea Mills, uh, Ronnie Mann, um, Jimmy Woolhead, like some like great guys that were wearing the kit for us. And, we had some quality control issues early on. You know, I was getting all the, the gloves and the shin guards and all that kind of stuff from, from Pakistan. And it's, I think it's a lot easier these days. I think there's a lot more like clearer channels, but back then, like it was just a little bit harder. Um, and then like getting apparel and stuff uh, made in China. And, and that was very, very difficult um, dealing with them. Stuff would turn up and it was just like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> just like weird shit. We'd have like, Three sleeves or something like what? Are you, who are you making? Like, surely you know what a t-shirt is. I'm like, oh, you didn't specify how many sleeves you want. It's, like, well, it's for a human being. <laughs> it was Checking just gonna stupid sleeves. shit like that. Um, it was just always a nightmare. Um, and I think, uh, like, social media wasn't what it is now. 
like, yeah, we had Facebook and stuff like that, but like social media marketing, like now, how it is now and, you know, Instagram and all, uh, like everything's just so super visual now. And I think it's probably easier. It's probably not easy because it's probably saturated, but easier to get a brand going now. If it looks good and you've got the right people on board and stuff and you put a bit of money into the marketing, it's probably a little bit easier, but we didn't really have that back then. Um, yeah, it just wasn't, you know, we're going back, again, going back to what, 2010, 2011, uh, 2011, maybe. Um, it just wasn't like the same. Like yeah. I think if I had something now, I'd be able to make like a much better go of it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it was cool. It was, it was just quite stressful. It just mm -hmm. got to the point of getting it. It was just like, just too much work for the reward. Give it a few yeah. years and just didn't take off. Yeah, shame, mate. Yeah, like I said, I, I really like the stuff. So yeah, good effort for, for the time that you had it, mate. It was Cheers. good. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> and then obviously fast forwards where we are now. You're obviously now known for the Chris Barris band. And you obviously mentioned earlier that you've been obviously playing music your whole life. So let's move on to that part of your life, mate. So away from fighting, tell us about sort of your music, your sort of band experience sort of growing up. And then obviously what led you then into to going full time into the band? Yeah, so I mean, pretty much the whole time I was fighting and, and coaching and doing the whole MA tie boxing thing. I was always still playing in bands, but it was just mainly just like cover band stuff. It's like playing in pubs and doing weddings and shit like that. Like I'd do maybe like, I don't know, like four, five, six gigs a month, you know, that kind of thing. Just keep my hand in and just doing like rock and blues covers really. Um, but then I found when, so when I came back from Thailand, um, I was in the UK rankings. So I beat like quite a good guy. It was about six or seven, I think I got two. It was definitely seven. I can't remember if it went to six one month because he beat someone decent and it put, put mm. me up. Um, you know, and I was starting to get some like decent offers coming on some like bigger Muay Thai shows. And I was like, yeah, this is really cool. I just couldn't heal my foot. And it was like six months went by and I was like, it would get better. And then I'd catch, like it'd be sparring and, you know, I'd miss time a kick or something. I'd land with like, my foot and it'd bend it back and I'd be fucked for another like eight weeks. And it's really annoying. Um, but anyway, in that time, I'd... I kind of needed a bit of an outlet. So I just started writing some songs. Um, and I started off, it was more like like bluesy rock stuff. Um, and it was just, this is a hobby really. I was just kind of like, my whole aim with the band was never to be doing <laughs> what I'm doing now, it's mental. Like I just wanted to just do a few gigs really and just uh, maybe do a few like small festivals and just wanted to sing my own songs. I was so bored of doing covers. Just wanted to sing my own songs to people that wanted to listen to them. Do you know what I mean? Whether that's only like 50, 60 people, like that's all I wanted to do, you know? Because it was just a different thing. Like when you're playing pubs and stuff, people, they don't really give a shit. If they do give a shit, it's only because you're playing like a song they like. It's not really because of you. Do you know what I mean? But like when you play like your own songs, like one that you know, you've written and they're like, into it or you know like now when we do gigs to like thousands of people and they're like singing like the songs back to you like it's just the best feeling yeah, in the cool, world you know it's, it's incredible um so that's kind of like why i wanted to do it i wanted to like sing my own songs to people that want to hear um and it just snowballed really so i was doing the two things alongside each other still coaching at the gym and um and i had a really successful fight team both ma and, and muay thai uh and then I got signed to a record label, like in the blues rock world, pretty much the best label I could possibly be signed to really. Mascot Records had all like the biggest names in blues rock. And it was mad, so like, I spent my whole life like, you know, cause it was all, that was my childhood dream. My childhood dream wasn't to be an MA fighter, you know, it was to be a rock star. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to travel the world, like playing to thousands of people. Um, and you know, you spend this whole time like, oh, you know, how do you make it? You know, it's a real like common thing. Like, like, how do we make it as a band? Like, don't know how to do it. And it's crazy. Like, I literally got a message from the boss of the record label through the contact form of my website, and it was just like he was a Dutch guy, and it was like, hey, Chris, seen your stuff. Uh, I think it's great. Are you signed, Ed? And that, that was it. Like, and I remember like my manager, I said to my manager at the time, I said, I've just got this email. It's like, I think it's someone having a wind up. <laughs> I was like, but do you want to like look into it? And then he ran me back an hour later. I was like, no, it's real. Like you're going to have an offer on the table by Monday. And I was like, what? And I remember I was in the studio at the time recording a new album. And it was one that I was paying for like myself, obviously. I wouldn't sign to yeah. a label. And I could only afford to do it in stages. I'd, I'd already, I'd recorded like four songs earlier that year. And then I was doing the rest then. I was in there just doing like the final like vocal takes. Like we nearly like finished the album and I got this offer. It was just like crazy. Um, 
And then, so I was doing that. Obviously, we were still, you know, pretty small then, only traveling the country, playing to between 100 and 200 people, whatever. Um, and then it just started, yeah, snowballing, started getting bigger. Then kind of the thing that tipped it over the edge, which meant that I had to kind of step away from the gym and, and from the fight stuff because I just couldn't dedicate enough time was uh, I had the opportunity to join like a, a pretty big American band called Supersonic Blues Machine. Um, that's like the main guy in the band at the time was like Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top. You know, it was like a guy that I used to look up to when I was a kid and used to sing his songs in pubs, you know, it was like absolutely crazy. Um, and so that came about because we got put forward to be their support act. They were doing a show in the UK at Shepherd's Bush Empire, it's like a wicked venue in London. Um, and I got put forward to be their support act. We, no one knew at the time that their lead singer had left and they were looking for a new front man. They saw some videos and they were like, oh, this guy's really cool. Um, and then got talking to my agent at the time and then, yeah, they said, well, look, can we like, speak to him? I think he might be good for the role. Just from seeing like a couple of videos and a couple of people saying, yeah, this guy's cool. Um, and then I had a few phone conversations. They were like, oh, do you want to come out to LA and, and jam with us? And I was like, yeah, cool. So they booked me some flights. So I went out to LA. I remember I landed and um, it was about, I don't know, seven, eight o'clock at night or something. You know, so obviously I was like pretty knackered. And I was speaking to like Fabrizio who runs a band and he's the bass player and the producer. And uh, he was like, oh, you know, Billy's just been on the phone. He wants to know if you want to, you know, go around his house and say hello. He's like, I understand if you're too tired though. And I was like, no, no, I'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we went straight from the airport up to Beverly Hills, up to his uh, mansion in Beverly Hills. And uh, he was just the coolest guy. And then we went out, uh, I can't remember, it was like sun, on sunset or something, and I had some beers and we ended up going to his favorite like Mexican place and I was doing shots of tequila with him. And it was just a wicked night, got really well. And then we were jamming that week. And uh, yeah, so I ended up joining them and we had quite a big tour in the summer all around Europe. Um, and that's kind of when I was like, look, I'm, now I'm juggling two bands. Like I can't juggle that with the gym. And I was letting people down, like fighters were having fights. I was like, oh, I can't do it because I'm on tour. Or, like I've got this festival that date, you know? And then so, like, and you just end up feeling a bit shit. I don't like doing anything like by half. So I'd prefer to not do it, rather, you know? So I had a chat with Darren and I was like, look, I'm going to have to step away. And I uh, ultimately ended up selling my shares and, and backing off out of it, yeah. Yeah, well, what an experience though, mate. It must've been so surreal. Yeah, it's pretty like, cool. <laughs> like saying, like eating and drinking with those people. Yeah. And what was that tour like? Sort of obviously, you know, you hear stories about rock stars and then you hear stories about fighters and then you've got a fighter who is a rock star. <laughs> like, like, is there any like stories of any ruckus or any like just, yeah, any madness from that tour in, in your time? Not really. Um, I mean, nah, no, it's quite all quite, I've never really been involved in anything like too mental. Mm. Like, you know, I like to have a few beers and stuff mm -hmm. right before play and a few beers after. But yeah, nothing too crazy. No uh, televisions being thrown out of hotel rooms. <laughs> 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 like, the tour was phenomenal. You know, it was quite. That first gig was the one at Shepherd's Bush Empire. You yeah. know, so I got put forward to be like the support act, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm I'm the front man of the headline band. Yeah, sure. Um, and it was the most nervous I've ever been before any gig. I remember just being like, what are you doing here? Like, you're not ready for this. Uh, and it was a really good gig. It was like, it wasn't perfect like, on my behalf, but uh, you know, I, I think I gave a good enough show in. Um, but yeah, fuck me, it was the most nervous. Mm. That felt like I was about to have a fight. Yeah. Yeah, proper, proper adrenaline. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> so it's so weird in it how like a, like a message can change your life like that. Just one yeah. little message and then it snowballs to something else. Yeah, it's crazy, really. And like I said, I spent my whole life going like, because you know, like my dad, so my dad was a musician um, and, you know, he got, he playing cover band stuff when I was a kid. We used to go and watch him all the time and he, he was my first guitar teacher and he actually played in my cover band as well. He was a bass player. Um, and he was always really, like, really supportive of the fight and stuff. He saw my first early fights. Then after I lost that MMA fight, he couldn't watch me again. Okay. And my mum wouldn't either. Mm. But they would always like, they'd always be the first people to like want to watch, watch it back. Like once it, once it known I was okay and the fight had happened, they'd watch it back. And so he was always super proud, but I always remember one night at a gig, like we'd finished and we'd had a really good gig and it was a local place called the Spinning Wheel and Paint and we used to play there like once a month pretty much. Yeah, I know the Spinning Wheel. Yeah, 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 yeah it's a yeah. cool place. Yeah. And um, we'd had a good night 
And I don't know, like some stuff had happened where it was a little bit different and I'd kind of gone off on one on the guitar and, and my dad, he wasn't always like massively vocal with stuff. Maybe not with me, I think like, but especially with the music stuff, he'd always be supportive, but wouldn't like impose his will on me. Um, and he was like, you're too good to not be doing this. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, I just wish you'd give it another go. And I was like, but how? Like, what do I do? I was like, I don't know what to do. Like, how do you make it, you know? And back then, again, social media, I think there was maybe, like, MySpace. Like, <laughs> that was it. Yeah. You know, YouTube had only just started around that time. Um, and it wasn't what it is now. Uh, and I was just, I just don't know how to make it. And back then, it was always the thing of, like, well, if you want to make it, you've got to move to London. Like, that was always the musician thing. Like, oh, you've got to be in London to make it. It's obviously not the case now because everything's online. Um, and he was like, yeah, I know, I don't know. He goes, I just think it's such a shame that you're not, like, not doing it. Uh, well, I lost him in, in 2012. Uh, he had a short battle with cancer and um, he was only 54 and hit me really, really hard, obviously. And kind of made me question a lot of things. And I, you know, I was doing really well at that point um, with the fighting stuff. I was on a bit of a streak with the MMA in particular and I had some really cool things lined up. And then he died... Uh, and I had to cancel one of the fights because it was like two weeks after his funeral or something like that. And it's like, okay, I can't do that. Um, but it like really like changed my perspective on things. And I just didn't, I just, I really got money hungry. And like, because my dad never really had much. Um, and the plan was like, when they retire, like he's going to get to do a lot of things, you know, and he, he never got to do it. Um, and so I kind of went on a bit of a mad one for a year or two, like, no, I've got experience these like, kind of things. And I ended up going through a breakup and, and all this kind of stuff. And um, so I didn't fight for a little while, like a year or two then. Um, but yeah, when I started, I got a little bit off track, but when I started writing the songs again, it was always with like his like memory in mind, like of saying like, oh, we should just give that like another go, you mm. know? Um, and yeah, and that's, that's what did. Yeah, mate. And your your lyrics and, and sort of, you know, the messaging you put out. I mean, where where does that come from? Because that's all that's like the, the, the music, that's obviously a skill set in itself, right? Um but obviously the writing and being able to write lyrics, that's been something that I've always been really impressed with. Like almost more so than the, the music. Yeah. But where does that come from? Uh, lyric lyric writing's the same as anything, I think. Like I've definitely got better as the albums have yeah. gone. I've got like, you know, I, every time I write a song, I think I get better at writing lyrics. Yeah. Um, Do you typically write, write about their personal experiences or is it like, you know, fiction? Yeah, both, you know, I mean, like I've, I've done a lot of songs from yeah. personal experience. Um, you know, I kind of got to the point where I, well, album three, I kind of like felt like I haven't really got any other experiences to like, sing about do you know what I mean and then Covid happened and that was a pretty rough time we had a lot of big things lined up that got cancelled um, that probably would have you know I mean it happened to everyone obviously um, but we were on a really really good trajectory we had a 33 date European tour with the darkness booked the darkness yeah cool. like epic you know yeah. and um, we're just starting to you know UK we'd, we'd done done well in um, but you know, once you get to like a certain level in the UK, you can only really tour like, you know, once a year, like all the equivalent of one tour, if you cut it up in half or not, but you can only really do that a certain number because again, you saturate it. You just won't sell the tickets. Promoters won't pay the money if you're not selling tickets. So like you need Europe to be able to like the main places, Germany, France, Netherlands, Scandinavia. Um, and we were starting to do well, but then COVID hit and we just struggled to like get going back out there again mm -hmm. since. Um, so, you know, COVID gave me a lot of, a lot of things, you know, I went through some, you know, never really suffered from depression in my life before. So I was, even after my dad died, I wouldn't say I went into a depression. I definitely did like in COVID, never felt like that before. Mm. A lot of people are like that though, aren't they? Uh, COVID definitely done that to a lot of, a lot yeah. of people even that I know. It just, Weird. it opened up this whole other side of just, mental health and yeah. just people like yourself who never experienced it and then probably sat in a room yeah it was just I just didn't I just didn't know if I was ever going to get to do it again you know like music and the arts was you know the last thing to be considered you know which I understand um, to an extent uh, you know so I just didn't know if we were ever 
you know, was this ever going to end? You know, it was supposed to be three weeks, wasn't it? You know, and it was just going on and on. <laughs> and it was like, fuck, I just don't know what I could do. The, I, the first, like, six months or so, I probably enjoyed it. Was it oh, fun? Sunny, the weather was it? really yeah, nice. Lovely, like, I was having barbecues every day. And like, it was like, oh, this is... I, I could do it another six months now. It was all right. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, once it just kept going on and on, and we kept getting tours pushed back and pushed back, and it was like, fuck. But it did give me time to write a new album. And that was when I kind of changed my direction. So my first three albums were, were blues, rock based. And then I just wanted to go heavier, you know, my teens and stuff, I was always playing in metal bands. It's kind of, I love the blues stuff. Like it's kind of what I started off playing when I was, you know, kid, five, six, whatever. But in my teens, I was always in metal bands. That's what I liked doing. Um, and so I started writing heavier stuff and my manager was like, this is probably a little bit too much. Like maybe you should speak to the label. Like, so I sent some demos and they're actually really supportive. They're like, no, I think this works for you. It's like, feels natural. It's cool. Um, and so, yeah, I carried on that path. So I've done two albums that are pretty much like in the heavier rock yeah. category. Um, and, you know, it's upset a few people on the way, but it's also like our audience and our fan base is, you know, I see the numbers, you know, and I know what we've done. Like it's like 10 times what we were doing before, you know, album really? sales, yeah. everything, you know, it's just, so it's, it's more popular grown. genre, isn't it? I think so. Effectively, yeah. 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 It, it definitely is. Yeah, I think so. And then have you always, when you, when you got signed back originally, was that the Chris Barris band back then? Or? Yeah, so I'm, I'm signed as a solo artist. Right. Okay. Um, I did, I was going to ask about the name. Yeah. So signed as a solo artist. The thing is like now I kind of almost wish it was a band name, but like in the blues rock world, it's very, very common to be called like your name trio or your name right. band. Do you yeah, know? It's okay. a very, very common thing. It's not as common in the rock world. So it almost, I think it feels a little bit awkward now. But um, yeah, I mean, originally when I very first started, it was Chris Barris Trio. Um, and then I got keyboard players and just started calling it Chris Barris Band. But like I said, in the blues rock world, it's quite a common thing to do. In the like heavier rock world, it's not really that common. Maybe that can be a good thing. It makes it stand out a bit more. But yeah, so I'm basically, I am a, uh, I'm signed as a solo artist. Um, and then I've got the same band. Um, I've had these, you know, Josiah on guitar. He's been with me since 2017. Drummer Billy's been with me since 2019. And bass player Fraser's been with me since 22. Yeah, a couple of years. So what, do you pay them? Out yeah. of your end, basically, yeah. you get paid from the, the yeah. So they're they're, yeah. they're more than than this, you know, like. But they are essentially like session musicians, you know. They get hired, but it's a lot more than that. Like, especially the lineup I've got now, like, is it's just great. We all get on so well. So it's like brothers. It's it's brilliant. We have such a laugh. It makes it, it makes it good. You know, there's yeah. no awkward personalities. There's no like weirdness. Just cool. And it's the same with the crew. I've got such great crew. Um, so generally tour, there's four band, um, and we will tour with like five or six crew, um, with a driver, sound guy, backline tech, monotech, tech, uh, media. Um, yeah. Oh, and merch. Yeah. It's mad, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty it's cool. big old setup, isn't it? Yeah. Like, yeah, it's, yeah. It's really cool, mate. Yeah, kind of the cool. days of just rocking up to a pub and tour band. Yeah, but we've done it. We're like, do you know what I mean? I went... I've driven the van up to like Manchester to do a gig, <laughs> play to 10 people and then drive the van all the way back. I've, I've done those days. That's what I mean though. You've earned it, haven't you? Definitely yeah. earned it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And now I mean, it's wicked. Like, you know, don't have to do anything We're on a double decker tour bus, mm. wake up. So you sleep through the night, wake up where you, the city you're playing in outside the venue, wake up like, go have some breakfast and just chill out and then you don't have to I don't, I don't even sound check anymore I, I can't even be bothered to sound check so yeah. like <laughs> I just turn up <laughs> gig time yeah, hour before awesome. have a couple of beers have a red wine and, and jump on yeah. yeah happy days and and when you were touring with the, the band out in the States was there ever an opportunity to continue that and and not continue with the Chris Barris band um, so that band is like I don't like using the term because I don't like put myself in that category but it's considered a super group yeah, so okay. it's like all different people that come together and on the recordings and stuff like that's amazing people like Steve Lucifer from Toto um, you know the band that did like Africa and mm -hmm. yeah like absolute legend uh, he did a lot of like Michael Jackson's guitar parts as well yeah yeah um, on the recordings uh, yeah and obviously but Billy Gibbons and, and lo loads of like great people um, so it's like a it's like a core band um and then it's like special guests 
come and get involved. So because everyone's so busy with their own schedules, it tends to just be like one thing a year. We couldn't get anything going for this year, unfortunately. Like everyone's schedules kind of clashed and it was a little bit awkward. But we've got some great stuff lined up for next year mm. and touch wood, it comes off and it should be pretty good. Great shows. We tend to just do like festivals, man. It's a really good like, band for festivals. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it can be quite hard. Like that's, it operates a little bit different to how my band will operate. So because we're in different, tend to be in like different countries every night. So it'll be like one big festival in like Norway and then you've got a festival in the French Alps or whatever. Like it was last literally what we had to do. We played at Notodum Festival and then we, the next night we were playing in Mijev and we had to, we finished, <laughs> we finished the set in Norway about 11 o'clock or whatever. Had to go back to the hotel, quick shower, grab your bags, like an hour's kip. And then we had to leave at like half one in the morning or something like that to get to the airport. Um, so we had a little hour, hour kip, trying to kip in the, in the van to the airport. Then we flew to Copenhagen, change, and then Copenhagen to Geneva, then drive from Geneva to Mijev and then do the gig there that night. And it's just like... It's like it's pretty ruthless, but mm. it's because we're in different countries all the time. There's no way, no way to do it, you know. Um, so that's pretty hardcore. I remember on the first time I did it, and um, I think I was just, I was really tired, and I was, I was a bit whingy. And B Billy Gibbons, you know, he's like, he was like seventy at the time, maybe like yeah, six nine seventy. He was, he was about seventy four now, I think. And um, you know, so it's an old guy. He's been touring for like fifty years. Like he's a proper like road dog. That's his life. Like. He's just like a tour robot. He's a machine like that just tours. Do you know what I mean? Like he's an absolute beast. And he said, "Remember, Chris, like we don't have to do this. We get to do it." Yeah. And that's just stopped me like forever. I was like, "Thought it was so fucking cool." And whenever I'm feeling a bit shit, I'm like, "Oh, I can't be bothered," you know, because it happens. Like you know, yeah, you get tired. Like you've got these long journeys, or whatever, and like you know, you, you, it does happen. And you're like, "Oh fuck, I'm not sure I've got the energy to do the gig tonight." I always remember that. Mm. and uh, it was quite funny because I was like oh I was whinging about how tired I was and he's like sprightly you know I'm there I'm like I don't know I would, I would have been like 34 34, 35 or whatever and he's like in 70 you know literally twice my age and he's like raring to go and I'm like whinging about being tired <laughs> <laughs> put me in my place pretty quick and I thought actually that's cool and that stuck with me forever that yeah it must be great having like a, a mentor like that just to, to kind of learn from and keep you on track a little bit yeah yeah definitely because I mean like he's literally been there and done it all yeah you know, been there and done it all um and yeah yeah it's pretty good like 50 years continually like at the top crazy I'm still selling out arenas like all over the world like it's mad it's still going now like uh, unfortunately, they lost their bass player, Dusty. Um, they, re they replaced him with a guy that had been the guitar tech with the band for like 30 odd years, who's part of the family anyway. Yeah, so yeah. it was pretty cool. So they're still like gigging up. They played it Wembley this year, like still going in their 70s. Like, yeah, it's amazing. fucking amazing. Yeah. I don't think I'll oh, help <laughs> I'm approaching 40 and I'm not thinking, fuck, I've been getting on a bit now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so where's your, um, where's your favourite place to, to gig? Ooh. I don't like picking favourites because everyone gets pissed off. If, yeah. <laughs> everyone likes to think their town's the best. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. If ever I put a thing like, oh, that was the best show of the tour, you'll see like people be like, what? Yeah. Um, oh, there's lots of great places, you know. <sighs> lots of great places. We always have a great night. Um, obviously, when we play in the Southwest, mm. that's, we've still kind of got the biggest fan base in the Southwest because that's where we started in the early days and did a lot of smaller festivals. And it's kind of grown from there. So like if we do Exeter or if we do like Torquay, we have like a pretty cool show. Um, but around the country, like Nottingham's always a great one. It's a, like a really famous venue there called Rock City. We've done the headline that in the main room a couple of times now and that's like a phenomenal night. We actually did it this year. It was the chart announcement date mm. and we were playing at, at Rock City on that night. Nice. So we just found out that we got to number five in, in the official charts and then we were playing like a, one of our favorite venues, which was like, packed out it was it was really really cool that was quite a special night mm. got a bit emotional yeah uh, got a bit emotional it was also weirdly it was the anniversary of my dad's death really yeah I so it was that. all a bit yeah i'll do a song i've got a song called watching over me that was like the first song i wrote when i set up when i decided to start doing music again yeah um and it's, it's just about you know losing my dad mm. um and yeah doing that it got a bit yeah, I got a bit emotional. Yeah. Number five is incredible, though, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, the aim was like we were praying for a top ten and to get top five. Yeah, it was. I mean, it, you know, people always say this, but it was a really tough week as well. Like the there was there was a lot of 
albums out that week. Uh, Beyonce um, was out, and, and there was a couple of like big, big physical sellers, like a band called James, like from the nineties. Like they had a song called "Sit Down," but they've got like a real hardcore following. They've car- carried on going, like a Manchester band, like indie band. They've got like a hardcore following. They end up getting number one actually. Um, Linkin Park released like a, a re-release thing of like a singles collection. It was just a real tough week. Yeah. Actually, if we were the following week, which is when Taylor Swift released her album, everyone avoided that week because of Taylor Swift. But if we released that week, we would have been number two with how many we sold. <laughs> so, uh, you <laughs> no. know, it's, it is what it is. But um, yeah, I mean, we never... F- never thought we'd, we'd get that high. Like I said, I was, we were hoping for top 10. That was like the aim at the start of the campaign. I was like, if we can get top 10, it'd be amazing. But to get top five was, was incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. How about which which country? So you named a few UK venues, but outside the UK, which country is your favourite? Uh, I mean, we've played loads of places. Uh, so here the Germans love a bit of metal. Ger- Germany, we have a great time out there, yeah. We are about to start a German tour, actually, in October. First headline uh, tour out there since uh, 2019 for us. So that's going to be pretty cool. Um, yeah, we have a great time in G- Germany. France is really cool. We've had some great stuff in Italy. Uh, Poland, we've done like quite a good f- yeah, few things like, in they Poland. Like all the metal yeah, stuff like that. Imagine, <laughs> like, yeah. Fucking nutters, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> done a bit in Norway. Uh, Netherlands, that's all. Like, I, I love that country. It's one of my favourites. Yeah. Stunning. Uh, and the venues out there are amazing. They're, they're like subsidised by the government. It's like oh, really? they put a lot of money into the art, so all the venues are like shit hot yeah, like it's really place, good great PA systems they look after you really well uh, really cool people um, I, I love playing out in the mainland uh, I really do um, we just got we just you know we're way behind out there with the numbers yeah. you know in the UK we'll be playing I mean it depends where we are but you know in general we're up you know some place at eight, 800,000 you know people per show but then like out in Europe, like some places will be plenty under people still. Yeah, you know? okay. Um, How about the States? Have you made out, out there yet? No, not yet. It's uh, We've just signed to a big agent in the States, actually, yeah. like literally just about a month ago. So um, see what happens. It's tough because it's so fucking big. You know, we say like America, like we say Germany, but it's like, it ain't the same fucking thing. No, it's like you know, Europe. every state's like a new country, yeah. you know, and it's the US is Europe. Yeah. <laughs> so we've we've toured with a band called Blackstone Cherry um, a few times and, and they're wicked like friends of ours at Ace. And over here, like they're huge and in Europe pretty big too. You know, they'll do like Wembley Arena and stuff like that. We did the Royal Albert Hall with them, you know, sold out like so like a big band. But in the States, like some places they'll still be playing like fairly small places, mm. you know. And they'll do well in like some cities, but in other places will still be like fairly small, like a lot smaller than they do over over here and it's just it's it's a hard country to to crack it yeah. you know how does um i always wonder how does how did like spotify have you always been in it with spotify and everything and being on spotify and mm-hmm. apple music and all that sort of stuff like yeah with the album charts and all this sort of stuff is it is it like changed a lot of how music's even published and, and promoted and all that sort of stuff yeah for sure and um, i mean my streaming numbers aren't very good i'm i'm fortunate that i do quite well on like physical sales like we yeah. sold a lot of vinyl sold a lot of cds and actually a lot of downloads too like believe it or not like people paying like on itunes and stuff mm. like that we had the number one for downloads that in the official charts as well um but yeah streaming i mean you've got to be on there like you know, you have to. If you can get on a big playlist, it's a great way to get new fans. Is it? Um, and it, it does count towards the charts as well. Yeah. So I, I, I always wonder how it works, and how how yeah. do you, do, you, do you get the money from it, or does your agency? So the record label, the record label, they yeah. get the money for it, and then they pay yeah. you basically. Yeah. So if I'll I'll get onto how record yeah, labels yeah. work, um, but yeah. So the stream, so like they count towards the charts. So what you end up having, so like the week I was in. Um, or I think it's changed slightly now. They're a little bit lower, but for for a long time, number five was kind of uh, you had gatekeepers of Dua Lipa and The Weekend. Right, their albums have been released ages ago because their streamer numbers are so high. Every week they'd be around five, six, or seven. Right. Because, okay. Yeah, but I, it's not quite clear cut in the exact numbers, like how it works, but. Yeah, it's approximately like a thousand streams or something will equal like one album sale, something okay. like that. Is that how they work out? It's like an algorithm type of thing. Yeah, it's something like a thousand, four thousand, something. And then I think it's different if it's a paid user that's listened to 
freeze. I'm not 100% sure, so don't quote me on any of this. But they do count something like that towards the chart. So you get these big artists that are just like right up there with old albums like um, Ed Sheeran, like most of his albums, if not all, are still in the top 40 and will always be around the top because he's, his streaming numbers are so high. He's always up there. Fleetwood Mac is always in there, rumours. ABBA are always love up there. I love a bit of Fleetwood Mac. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Abba's always up there. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't know what greatest hits or something like that. Yeah, because people are just streaming it so much, and obviously since like Mamma Mia and stuff like that, and whatever else. Um, yeah, like yeah, it's a weird one streaming. Like I so said, we're not actually our streaming numbers. If you look at it, doesn't reflect where you are. No, but then on like vice versa, I've got a couple of bands I like, and you look and they got like couple, like one half million, two million monthly listeners. It's like loads more than me. But they're still like only selling 100, 200 tickets, or they're supporting bands at like 300, 400 capacity venues. And you're like, do you know what I mean? So, like, it's much better for me to be like an artist that can sell tickets and can sell physical because there is more money in that. The key to like making its bands, you've got to be able to sell tickets. Like, that's yeah, yeah. it. It's the same as with fighters, right? Mm. Like, if no one wants to watch you, like, you ain't getting anywhere. Like, people, you know, you get opportunities on shows and stuff when you can sell tickets. I think there's a lot of hardcore people as well who like to just go out and watch bands, and especially UK bands and stuff. I know my stepbrother, he's he's massively into just going around. He's probably watching you. I'll, I'll tell him after this, he'll probably wet his pants. But <laughs> he, I know he goes around and just watches like a lot of lot of UK bands and he loves it and he travels and does all that. So that's probably your like demographic of people that, yeah. that watch you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's definitely like a scene. Yeah, a scene. Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely. And there's like, there are people like that and they'll they'll have like a few bands that they follow and or they follow the scene and they'll be like, oh, this new band's coming up and they go and see them. And there's a few festivals that also like cater to that kind of thing that scene and like planet rock radio digital radio station that they've been great for bringing on bands they've been like instrumental in in helping make my career um because the people that listen to that are people that like rock music and guaranteed yeah like you know rock fans not guaranteed they're gonna like what you do but like you're getting it right in front of the, the right audience you know much more than like Radio 1 or something, you know, it's much more direct, like funneled to people that like this kind of thing. With Radio 1, they'll have Bring Me the Horizon on playing like something heavy and then they'll have like some weird like pop thing and then they'll have like a <laughs> rap artist or something. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, like, it's all mixed. Um, but yeah, but with record labels, um, how it works, and it will sound like I'm shitting on record labels, which I'm not because I... You'll get people that will be like, oh, I need to be independent. And maybe you can. Um, but I still think there's definitely a place place for it. Because anyone can record music and upload music now, right? You can pay like 60 quid or whatever, DistroKid or CD Babe or something, and they'll just distribute your music to Apple Music and Spotify, all that. Anyone can do it. You could do it now. Like, can just, boom, out it goes, right? Um, and the thing is, like, a lot of people do that. So there's a lot of shit out there. And then the filter... Like, there has to be some kind of filter because festivals and radio stations, all this kind of thing, they get bombarded with this shit all the time. And I know because every time I announce a tour, I get bombarded, like, on, through social media. Oh, like, oh, can we support you? You know, and there's some decent bands. There's also some apps, like, terrible bands that are like, you know, they haven't even done a gig yet or whatever, and they think they're going to come on a tour. Like, it doesn't work like that. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They've done a couple of, like, pub gigs. And then, like, oh, yeah, we'll be your support bands. Like, you know, so it's like, there has to be some kind of filter. And I feel like a record label is actually quite a good good filter I feel like it can kind of get you more opportunities once you're attached to like a name um, so I'm signed to a label now called Earache Records which was super big in the, in the metal world and now they've kind of branched out more you know they're doing a bit more like rock stuff and even some more like bluesy rock stuff mm. um, but how it works is basically like they front all the money so you, you sign a deal and you agree an amount for like what they'll give you for the album and then there'll be like a marketing budget and things like that and then you get a percentage and then out of your percentage, you have to pay back that amount they've paid. So, the, yeah. So, like, if the standard kind of artist royalty rate is about 20%. So, just for ease of maths, let's say the album costs 100 grand. You'd need to sell half a million for your 20% to pay back that 100. Do you know what I mean? Okay, yeah, yeah. Before okay. you'd see a penny. Yeah. So, it's quite hard to ever that's called recouping um so when you say like that it will sound like i'm like oh fuck it's such a shitty deal but it's not because i haven't got 100 grand to put into an album campaign mm. like i do you know what i mean like i ain't getting that kind of money like i can't do that so 
I'm, I'm, so they're I'm, investing in you quite heavily yeah, to then know. hopefully then make some money and you make money. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think the, the main way artists will make money these days is by the touring. Arts my level, you'll make like this year, I saw quite a big jump in like our festival fees and our positioning and lineups and stuff like that. It's like we're headlining a lot of bigger things now. And then like the money goes up quite a bit when you're at that. And it's like, okay, now I can see where it can start earning some money. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, that's live is the way that you, you make the money festivals and touring merchandise. Um, I don't think you can rely on, on just streaming and stuff. So when you talk about the, the, the sort of album campaign, like what's involved with that? So where does that, where does that money go into a campaign? Yes, yeah, lots of stuff. I mean, like Earache, the label, we have a, a fantastic at digital marketing. Um, and it's the thing that I was always really impressed at but with, I could see they were doing with other bands before I signed with them. And I, I was in between labels looking who I was going to sign with. And they were like a band that I'd always see their stuff and be like, they do a great job with this. Mm. Um, and, you know, they, they invest a lot of money into the videos. Um, yeah, there's like uh, social media marketing budget, you know, it all adds up to it. Photo shoots. Um, and, and also like them having the expertise, you know, you can't put like a price on that kind of thing. They've done this thing like hundreds of times. Like I haven't, like trust these people. It's like, you know, I've got quite a big team around me now and people are like, oh, don't you like miss the control? And it's like, well, to some extent, like, cause you do spend a lot of time sitting around going like, I wonder if anything's been done or will this come off? You know, and like, it's all completely out of your hands. But at the same time, like I'm leaving it to people that are a lot more experienced than me. Like, I don't know how to be an agent. I don't know how to be a, a manager. I don't know how to be a record label. Like, leave that to the people. That know how to do yeah, that. Yeah, they've done it for years and, and got proven track records. Like, yeah, that makes um, sense. So I've, I've never been arrogant about it in that way. And um, I'm super happy with my situation uh, with being part of a record deal, uh, record label. Um, and yeah, I, like I said, I, I, I've got kind of peers and, and people I know, maybe friends, that are like, oh yeah, I'm independent, but it's, like, it's like, well, yeah, but you don't really know. Like maybe you make, you're making like, you made 20 grand out of your album or whatever, like cool. But then what? Like you're not getting any big opportunities, you're not selling more tickets, you haven't got to the next like yeah. stage, you know? You always want to do better as a team. I always think that, you know, people yeah. around you, good people pushing you in the same direction. Don't yeah. You? And I said, I, you know, I, I started this because I wanted to play live and that's the bit I enjoy. Um, so everything I do is to increase the crowd sizes and so I get to play more places and, and can do more of that. That's all I, all I want to do. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So then when you, when you go to, to gigs and you sell the tickets, do you kind of skip all of that or does that still go through the agency as well? No, so um, you'll have uh, a promoter. Yeah. So basically like the chain, uh, I have a manager. Yeah. Uh, and then he'll kind of coordinate everything. So then I have a booking agent. I've signed to like a really big agency, ITB agency. They've got lots of like huge acts. Um, and then they will deal with promoters that want to basically buy the show or they might buy a few shows. Yeah. So they'll put in an offer and be like, I oh, will pay you X amount for this show. And then they tend to be almost called a versus deal. So you'll have a guaranteed fee versus 80% of the profit, whichever's higher. So if you sell out, chances are that would like eighty percent of that profit would be higher than what your fee is. So then you'd get get the extra at the end. Yeah. Um, but you don't. The only way you would get all the ticket money is if you were the promoter yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, so which which we don't do. We work with like national promoters. We work with DHP and they still work with like Ed Sheeran and stuff. You know. Um, and we work with with loads of other good promoters too. Yeah. But yeah, they buy the show or they buy a few shows yeah, okay, got it. and it works like that. Yeah, it makes sense. And you obviously said that your real passion is about playing in front of crowds. Like what's the, uh, I guess, when you think about it all being said, all said and done, like where do you want to have played? Do you know what? I just don't really know. Like I've already achieved everything, <laughs> <laughs> like much more than I ever set out. I don't really have, uh, not in like, it can be dangerous not have goals. I don't have any, I have, short-term kind of goals, I suppose. Like we always want to like get to bigger venues and do that, but I'm not, I don't sit down and go, right, I want to be playing 
headline in Wembley Arena by, you know, 2027 or whatever. I don't, I don't have anything like that because I don't know if it will. Like a lot of it, like I said, it's not in my hands. I can only do like so much. Like it's whether we can get these opportunities on like bigger support tours and yeah. we, we've been put forward for some like really, really big ones and we've not gotten them. And then it's like, uh, you know, if we had like, one really big arena tour, like that could change everything, you know? Like imagine if we're supporting a band like, I don't know, Nickelback or someone like or Alter Bridge or you know, an arena band like that you know can do big numbers all the way through Europe. If we got a tour like that, it completely change. Yeah, okay. You're obviously very yeah. you're obviously very pragmatic with your thinking. But if you could write your own script, <laughs> like, where would be the coolest place to play? Uh, I mean, I'd love to be able to headline Royal Albert Hall. Yeah, so okay. we got to play there as a support act. That was pretty incredible. Yeah, but I think that's kind of like I think that's one of those things that any that most artists would want to like tick off. I think that's quite a big, big feel. I say I'm lucky I got to do it as a sport act, but I know like for Blacks and Cherry, they'd already done like Wembley and they'd done loads of like really big stuff, but they were like, we want to do Albert Hall. I remember speaking to like, Chris, the front man. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, he's like, we want to do the hall. And like, they kind of put it in like as a, a bit of a thing as part of a deal that they were negotiating. It was like, yeah, we'll do it, but we've got to do the Royal Albert Hall. Like it was something he really wanted to do. And they ended up doing like a live album DVD there. It was like really, really cool. Um, yeah, so like, you know, bands at that level, yeah. are they're like, nah, that's, you know, they've already headlined Wembley Arena and they're like, nah, but we want to do Albert Hall, you know. So I mean, that would be pretty cool. Um, lots of festivals, you know, like to work our way up the bill at Download. We, mm -hmm. we had a really good slot on the second stage a couple of years back. It'd be great to be able to work our way up uh, the bill there. Um, and then some of the bigger German festivals, it's like Wacken, would be really, really cool to do. Um, but uh, I'm just... Just want to keep it plodding, make sure it can pay the bills and, and can financially cover itself and, you know, not make me go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I'm happy kind of plowing on with it, really, yeah. and seeing where it goes. I don't know. I d don't know if it can get any further. Like, I don't. It's already gone much further than I thought it would. Yeah. Is it a good enough? Am I good enough to go much further? I don't know. I honestly don't know. <laughs> like, I just... Just enjoy I'll the journey, what, huh? what I can do and... Uh, yeah, it's hard. I'm mean, like, the music industry is fucking hard. It's really hard. A few things. Like, now it's kind of changed a lot. Like, you've got to be like a social media influencer. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I'm 40 next year. I don't want to be doing fucking TikTok dances and stupid miming. Do you know what I mean? It's just not what I want to be doing. But it's kind of like, you see a lot of artists. I see some big artists, like, that I respect, like, doing this shit. Like, these, like, meme-type TikTok. And I'm like, oh, it's just... They're having to do it. Like their yeah. record labels have done it. Like, you gotta do this. Like, and I think these guys are like fucking huge artists. Like they're having to do all these little lame ass things. Like I just got no time for it. Like I said, I just want to play live. I don't want to be a social media influencer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, the other thing is like one thing I miss about the fight industry. I, I've enjoyed just being back around the gym, really, and kind of like like minded people and going to some of the fight shows and seeing some of the old face. But like the music industry is full of people. They've never been punched in the face. <laughs> like, they probably need a punch in the face. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's just like, there's a lot of snaky fuckers. And I feel like in the fight game, obviously there's disagreements and stuff, but there's a few things at play. One, I think there's always like a level of respect there. Like, yeah. if you've been a fighter and they're a fighter, like, even if you disagree, there's always like a level of respect there. And, you know, and if it really gets so far, you can settle it, like, quite easily. Do you know what I mean? Um, without being sneaky and snaky and... And also, I think you know, music's very subjective, right? Like, it's very much like it's, it's all down to opinions. What some people think is great, other people think it's like shit. Um, and whilst that can be true in the fight game, like, because it's proven in the cage or in the ring, like, it's it's a lot more like transparent kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? It's like, well, you think I'm shit? Oh, all right, okay, fine, but I'm getting in there and I'm fucking doing it. Which with a band, like, it's not quite, do you know what I mean? It's all down to opinions. So, um, yeah, like I said, like some of the characters you come across, um, at the higher end of the industry, I've never had any problems. Yeah. Like all the big bands I've met and toured with, big artists, big players in the industry have all been the coolest people. It's kind of the people I've met on the way up, like, like snaky little shit bags. <laughs> um, and like I said, it's like people that they're used to getting away with it, right? They can just gob off and like, they've never had a slap. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, when, I, when I, I've had enough, I've, I've decided I've, uh, I'm bored of this life. <laughs> I'm going to go on a rampage <laughs> and give all these motherfuckers a slap. <laughs> I'm not really. Maybe I don't know. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> Look forward to that. <laughs>
be a nice one. Yeah. Mate, if you uh, if if you were to like, offer advice to like uh, I don't know yourself as a kid paying for fun, like what would you what, what would you say in regard to kind of being successful and keeping your head straight? Do you know what? I don't know. I get other bands asking me this, like, oh, how how do you make it? How do, you know? And it's just like I don't know. You just fucking plow on and just keep writing songs and keep trying to get better. You know, one thing I think I've been pretty good at is being able to look at myself and uh, see what I'm not good at and what I am good at and try to make myself better. You know, I spent a long, I'm not a fan of my voice. I don't actually like singing. I don't, I do it because I do it. But like, if I could be in a band and just be a guitar player, like I'd probably be happy. <laughs> like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I've spent a lot of time on my voice. I've done singing lessons and courses and I've, I've put a lot of time and effort and it's got a lot better and I'm happier. Um, and same with guitar playing, you know, I've spent a lot of time on my guitar playing, but being able to look at things and go, right, I'm not very good at this. Let's try and, whereas actually I think there's quite a lot of people that I've come across. I'm like, I don't think they're doing that. You know, do you, do you, I've worked hard on my songwriting. I've worked hard on my lyric writing, trying to not be so obvious, you know, trying to phrase things in a way so that it's like, you know, a bit more articulate rather than just being like, you know, saying exactly what it is, you know, trying to be a bit more like, like all the, the best songs are really. Um, and I've, I've kind of analysed myself and be like, well, this isn't good enough, this isn't good enough and tried to make it better. I'm not saying it's amazing, but it's like I'm doing stuff to the best of my ability. Um, but I definitely come across people that, and again, it tends to be the ones lower, lower down the ladder that will think they're the shit. And it's like they're not analysing themselves and not thinking like, oh, I'm, gonna try, I'm trying to work on this. And, you know, so it's like, I am, I'm the man, you know. Do you think that's the, the martial artist in you a little bit? Do you think like the humility of, of, you know, sort of training martial arts and getting beat in the, you know, in the gym and in, the, in competition has allowed you to be more self-reflective than your average musician? Uh, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I think it's just part of my personality. I think that, that personality trait probably helped me to get better at stuff and I don't really consider myself a martial artist either I don't really like that term because I always think it's just like my like some fucking fat loser doing <laughs> kata in a fucking village hall do you know what I mean like I, I'm not doing that I was like I was a fighter do you know what yeah. I mean like Muay Thai is not martial art it's a fighting sport and you know Brazilian Jiu Jitsu it's a sport it's not yeah. martial art I don't see I, I don't do it for that reason I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for like a sport yeah, that's it's, it, you it's know and I can compete and I come. I'm doing a sport, it's a game. I don't see it as set with people like, oh, it's rubbish for self-defense. It's like, I'm not training my fucking De La Hiva guard so I can fucking thwart an attacker in a bar. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I don't give a fuck. Like, I'm doing this shit because I enjoy doing it and it's part of the game. Like, yeah. do you know what I mean? Like, so I, I, I don't view myself as a martial artist. I just, I was just like a, a fighter and someone that likes fight sports. Yeah. Um, but I definitely think having an analytical mind, particularly with jiu-jitsu, right, because it's such a... It is a game. It's physical chess, right? A lot of people don't understand it unless you do it. Um, you know, I think it, you have to have that kind of mind to be able to, otherwise you just won't ever get better. Yeah. You know? And I think, and I did, it's been hard for me. Like, so I had so many years out and I've come back to do jujitsu now over the past, uh, it's not last Christmas, Christmas before. So it's like coming up two years, I suppose. And then obviously I've had tours. I've been away for a month or two and then I come back. And when I'm back, I tend to smash train. I'll train like at least every day, if not twice a day. Um, and, but, you know, it's quite hard for me because I had at least 10 years out of the gate, you know. I got my purple belt in 2011. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I'm still a purple belt now. <laughs> so, so it was longer than you. I know, yeah. I thought I was the longest belt. I got my blue belt, belt. 2000 and 2008, yeah, and I got my purple belt 2011. Yeah, okay. um, and I'm still a purple belt. But, you know, I'd come back and, like, the game's completely changed. It's completely changed. And you know, I'm getting tied up in knots by like little shit bags. <laughs> this is like driving me mad. So I like I really like I had it. You know, I used to be the like the the man, like, you know, I was I'd be able to like roll with most people. I'd get beat by like top people maybe, you know, but like I'd be able to handle like most people. And then coming back and just getting filled in by like little eighteen year olds, like yeah, it was hard. And so I had to eat a lot of humble pie and, you know, really like looking at, right, okay, if you want to be good at this, let's let's get good at it and choose. I'm very good at like choosing something and be like, right. So like a lot of last year was just working on my guard, you know, and like, so I'm quite, being an MA fighter, quite physical, like top game 
lends itself natural to me. So I like, put myself in that position, like getting smashed there to get my guard better. It worked. And then I was like, right, okay, now I'm going to work on my guard passing. And, you know, so I've always been quite good like that. Now I'm doing more no-gi stuff. So I'm like really getting into the leg lock game. And there's so many more positions that people just weren't doing mm -hmm. like back in the day, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's cool. It's exciting. But it's, you know, I, I, came, I started back training. The reason I started back training was um, super unhealthy, fat, drinking all the time, drinking every day, um, you know, being a rock star. And uh, I'd, I'd been doing a music video somewhere up country and I was driving back and I'd never really listened to podcasts. It's never really been my thing. <laughs> Sorry, guys, uh, shit on your, uh, on your trade. <laughs> but I was quite late to the game. You know, I just thought like I, was, I had no music to listen to and it was quite a long drive. And I was like, oh, fuck it. Everyone goes on about Joe Rogan. I'll find something. And I just whacked on him with Mark Zuckerberg. I thought, let's just see what this guy's got to say. And he was talking about like fitness and stuff and was saying like when he... Uh, he used to do a lot of jogging, a lot of running. But he said, like, he couldn't switch off. And, like, that's always been my, my problem. Like, I can't switch off my mind. I'm always, like, so consumed with whatever I'm doing. Um, and he was like, but when he started jujitsu, like, just for fitness, he found, like, it was the only thing he could do where he didn't think about work. Because if he started thinking about work, you're getting choked the fuck out, right? And that really resonated with me. I was like, that's so true. It was like, I need to go back. And that's why I went back. Like, I was, I was looking for something. Mm. Like to get fit again, but like just going out running and stuff, like just hate doing it. Unless if I absolutely have to do it, if I'm trying to like lose weight for a, a comp or a fight or whatever, then I used to do it. But like, I just, yeah. I don't get people that run for fun. Like, yeah, it's nothing better than jujitsu. I'm not trying fitness, to be the, the best no. at exercising. Yeah. <laughs> and then you obviously competed recently. Was that just for a bit of testing or are you kind of getting that competitive edge back? Yeah. So I just did it just again. I'm like, if I don't have like some time for, I'm just, I'm, I'm not, I'm not very good. Like I just, like I can't diet unless I've got some, like a reason to diet. Like I'm not that bothered about aesthetics. I probably wouldn't let myself get like morbidly obese, but I'm not that bothered about being like shredded or anything like that. Like I like it, like for loss of weight and look a bit better, but I'm not, not enough to put in that effort. So I thought, well, I'm going to book in some comps. Like I was finally getting to a place where like my fitness was getting better and my jujitsu was getting to a point where I was like, okay, I feel like I'm all right now. So yeah, booked in to do some comps and um, yeah, did one a few weeks ago and um, it was weird being back in an environment where like dealing with the adrenaline and stuff like that. Like, I didn't feel nervous, but it of like it it must affect me. I mean, the first I so I had basically I had one person in my gi division and one person in my no gi division, which meant we did like a round robin, right? It's a free best of three, um, and the gi like. It was like first up in the morning and like, I tried to do a warm up, I thought I was warm and I didn't feel nervous. But I mean, I was so shit, like <laughs> so, so shit. Just completely, I mean, I feel bad for the guy. Like I didn't even give him any kind of like, like and I remember just like, he like grabbed me and I'm like, oh, right, yeah, okay, oh, right, yeah. Oh, always pulled guard, oh, okay. Yeah, I'll do this. I'm like, oh yeah, I feel all right. Oh, he swept me, all right. Uh, and I was just like, not anything like what I would normally be like. I was like, what the hell? It was really bad, like terrible. I was embarrassed, I was like, fuck. So it obviously affected me. I just haven't been used to dealing with that for like so, I haven't been in a competitive environment since yeah, 2014. It just felt really weird. Um, and then I had a bit of a break and uh, it was the Nogi. Um, and you know, I did oh, what a lot of people do with jujitsu stuff. They look up on smooth comp and see like, you know, what your opponent's done. And like, he won his last competition or like one recently with like five submission wins. I'm like, oh, I see him like warming up and like, and I've just had that before. It's so like, I'm going to get murdered. <laughs> I'm just going to be <laughs> shit. I'm just going to get murdered. And then we came out and again, it's like the best of three. And, um, we kind of locked up and I was a lot more relaxed. I was like, ah, oh, I feel more like myself now. And, uh, Kind of got an underhook, he pulled guard, and then I just went straight to like pass his guard. And but I left this like kind of like sloppy there, and he cracked on like a mirror lock. You know, I can't do it because my actual arms are still working, but um, you know, it cracks yeah, like yeah. that, and literally, like, it it made a proper noise, like really bad. And I had to like verbally tap, so I was like, oh, fuck, I've just lost three bites, I'm gonna have to go back. I'm like, no way, I was like, there's no way I'm going out like that. It's like, fuck's sake, and I was feeling good, it just got caught, and I was just a bit sloppy. Um, and I think they fought because the ref was like, medics. I was like, no, medics, no. Fuck. And I was like, I can move my arm. I'm like, it's fine. Like, fucking, it. I was so embarrassed. And so I think they thought I was done. Like, 
but I went up to her, I was like, look, I'm, oh, mate, I'm up for it. Let's just keep going. Like, you know, I was like, just ask if you get this arm, don't crank it. I was like, I'll just tap. Like, I've got no ego. I'm here to get experience, get back into it. And he was like, yeah, yeah, no worries. But I just hid it, the whole thing. But then I ended up winning the next two. What I got for foot lock in the next match. And then uh, I got to take down and, and a few positional things and one by points and, and that. So it was quite cool to like go through that because I'd never felt like in any of my fights, I never like froze or anything like that. I was just like ready to fucking go, you know? And it's weird. And Jiu Jitsu is a bit of a weird one, right? Because you don't want to be like that. Like mm-hmm. when you step into a cage, you can be like, fuck yes, yeah. smash this guy's head in. But you don't really feel like. You always say that, don't you? Yeah. So I you felt a bit different. weird. Yeah. Like, yeah. so, uh, you know, but it was quite cool to like go through that and then to win the gold medal at the end to be like, you know, I've been really shit. I could have just gone home. I was about to say, yeah, you could have you just quit, can you? You're out your arm, I Like, no, I'm going to fucking keep going. Like, I know I can do better. And then, like, actually perform, you know, how I know I can perform. Um, it was quite good to go go through that. I was quite lucky having, like, quite a few matches. If it had been, like, there'd been loads of people in my category, um, then I would have just been out after the first way if it was a knockout. I was quite lucky only having one where we could do the best of three. Mm-hmm. It's pretty cool that they do that. Um, and, yeah, so... Yeah, it's cool. So I'm back on it. I'm um, gonna go out and do the Euros in January. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. nice. Ski and then um, got a few things this year. Going to see. I might do the Devon Open. Um, so my arms has been playing me up a little bit. So at the moment I'm only like drilling and stuff. Um, might do the Dublin Open as well. Get another IBJJF on him. Mm. So yeah, mainly gi. Even though I'm just gonna fit no gi stuff in and around. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so going against the trend a little bit there, mate, with more gi, I think. A lot of people seem to be doing no gi more so these days. Yeah, and that's I've been getting into. I mean, I did, also I won gold in the no gi, and that, but that was like, I'd only done about six no gi sessions. So I've just been doing all gi stuff. Yeah, and okay. I was like, oh yeah, like, fuck it. Like, whilst I'm there, I might as well do it. Yeah. Um, and I have been getting a lot more into it, getting more into the leg lock stuff. Been working with my coach, uh, Martin Ward, he's awesome and all that kind of thing. Mm. And I've been doing like one-to-ones with him to try and get my head around the stuff. And it feels great. I feel like I'm learning a whole new game because we just didn't have this i mean it, it just maybe it was around but like no one was really doing this kind of stuff like yeah. in, not as in depth we do like i mean you know i, I used to like doing again like Achilles locks i used to like doing knee bars but it was a lot more basic all the positions now it's like it's it's full on and if you don't know it you're getting fucked yeah. up right yeah, mate it, it must be so weird coming back because i've i've kind of we joked that i've i've been a purple up for a while i was a purple up for a long time i think i got mine in 2015 and i got my brown off time this year um, but I've, I was kind of in and out, so I wasn't like you. Where I had a massive hiatus. I had like a two year, about two and a half, two, two and a half year hiatus over a sort of pandemic. But I was always in and out a little bit. So I've kind of seen the, the change and, and paid attention to it. But that's why I've, I've, I've got this in here because it just reminds me of the old days. Yeah, I've got that one. Yeah, where we used to learn from that sort of stuff. But it, you're right, it's it's so different now. So you yeah, haven't been out for that long coming back. It must have been yeah, mad. Mind blown. Yeah, yeah, mind blown. yeah. I mean, I remember like last time I was doing gi, like. 50 50 guard had just started becoming a thing <laughs> yeah. like people like oh this new thing yeah that's, that's, that's mad it's weird isn't it I've, I've been doing that since like six months in yeah like, yeah just training of course yeah. Time. yeah it's mad um but it's been cool like like i said I, I wanted to get stuck in something to like keep me sane mm. f- you know from being involved in the music industry because it's just consumed me too much yeah. and i wanted something that could like take away you know, give me a bit of respite because I just end up driving myself nuts, mm-hmm. like waiting for stuff that I've no it's definitely control over. Definitely good for over. the mind, though, isn't it? Yeah, hundred percent. It's, it's something as an adult you can focus on. Yeah, that's what I always find. You can, you, like you said, you work on something specific, and then when you feel like you want to move on, you can just move on. And I, I train like that as well. I'll just be like, oh, I'm pulling guard now. I'm yeah. doing this now. And I, I, you know, I do like you said, I, I do favour the gi. Yeah. Um, mainly because I feel like there's more you can do. Um, I think no gi is probably easier. Um. I mean, it depends who you're against, doesn't it? I think, you know, my leg lock game would need a bit of work before I could step in and, and compete it against anyone that really knew what they're doing, mm. like at a higher level, like against Brown or Black Pulse or whatever. But, um, but yeah, I just find like there's just more with a key, I think. I yeah. just enjoyed getting stuck into that. But next year I'll be doing both. For like, yeah, nice. Yeah, you have to come down and train with us at some point, mate. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. good to that. But yeah, I look forward to seeing, uh, seeing other competitions go, mate. Any chance of the gloves going back on, mate? Or is it just a Jiu Jitsu, do you think? Do you know what? I just don't have any desire to go and train to earn a few hundred quid, maybe a grand from an MMA fight or whatever. I just, do you know what I mean? Like, and also the new breed of fighters, it's just, I feel like physically I could get into the shape and like be okay. Yeah. But like these guys now, they're, they're, they've been training since they're kids. Mm-hmm. 
like, and now they're like in their twenties and stuff. Like, it's just a different world from what I came up in. I just, I don't think I'd be able to compete. Um, if I did fight again, the only thing I would do was uh, if the band ever got big enough that I uh, had a bit of a name so that I could do one of these misfits things. Oh yeah, I'd do that just for the money. I'd go punch up some YouTuber. Yeah, we could probably hook you up with that because we know the meaty from... Uh... Clip it up. Get me involved. <laughs> <laughs> I would. Like, do you know what? I think I'd be like, you know, I'm a guy approaching his 40s. You know, I've got a legit fight record. Like, if you want to prove yourself, like, do you know what I mean? If you're a YouTuber wanting to prove yourself, I could yeah. be the guy to do it. Let's do it, man. Let's yeah. talk to the camera. I could be the one. You can make your name off me. <laughs> Done. I'm an easy target. 40-year-old yeah. fight. I've not fought for 10 years. Come on. <laughs> That's the uh, the only thing that I think, just because of the money, like, do you know what I mean? Like, Yeah. I just did the years of going around the country fighting for a couple hundred quid. I just can't be asked to fucking well, do that. They're looking into doing... MMA, yeah. Misfits now. Yeah. Right. Misfits so MMA. That's, that's what they're looking at doing next. So you Get on. Push you in, mate. <laughs> <laughs> mate, if people want to buy your albums, mate, like tell us the, the names of your recent albums and, and where people can buy them. Yeah, so the latest album, Halo Effect. Um, basically anywhere you buy music, anywhere, you know, so you can stream it on Spotify, app music, all that stuff. Um, and you can buy it from... Amazon, HMV, wherever, all the usual. Yeah, legit. And go any tours planned, did you say? Yeah, so we're going to Germany in a couple of weeks uh, for the first time in a while. We're doing a co-headline tour with a band called Gun. Um, so that's going to be pretty cool. Um, and then I've got UK dates uh, beginning and end of November. Um, so we've got, yeah, throughout, throughout the UK, it's kind of like 10 dates. Uh, that's a continuation of kind of our tour that we did around the album in April. Um, so that's going to be good. Uh, and that's it then for this year. Yeah, decent. Do you want to shout out anybody or, or plug anything else, mate? <laughs> Not really. No. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think. <laughs> no worries, mate. Well, mate, it's been good catching up, mate. It's good to see you. And uh, yeah, look forward to the, the music, mate, and, and the jiu-jitsu comp as well. Thanks for coming on. Nice one. Cheers, Cheers for having me. Thank you. Cheers, buddy.